carnival. I think the achievement pressure looks good. Call right now. Water towers fly! Yes! go down to nominal. Flat down to your feet off. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. All right. <laughs> Everybody, we are juggling a lot today, but let me know if you can hear me and see Alicia and me. Hi. It's time, says 5x5 five five in chat. Whew. Okay. <laughs> it is time for another joint show with Intrepid Museum. A little bit of a name change this month. Starting through the next year, we used to do something called Virtual Astronomy Live. It was virtual a lot of the times. There wasn't always a lot of astronomy involved, except when we talked to, like, you know, the James Webb team or whatever. But uh, we've changed the name of the show slightly to just Astro Live. So Astro the Live. Astro Live, just Astro Live. Now, we do have yeah. astronauts sometimes and other astronomical topics, right? That's true. We do. Right. But we thought, yeah, it'd be better to kind of, you know, be a little more inclusive of all of the topics that we talk about. Rockets and shields, heat shields, right? All heat sorts shields. of things. That's astronomy. That's so, astro adjacent, right? It is. It is. So we are astro <laughs> live now. Don't be confused. Same great content. Don't be confused. <laughs> and uh, if you're wondering what's going on, this show once a month goes out to all the different places. You'll find it on Intrepid's YouTube channel. They have a Facebook as well. Um, we've got it on the NASA Spaceflight channel. It's over on my Twitch channel. Intrepid has a Twitch too, if you even know about that. But all these different places that you can be watching. So wherever you're watching from, thank you so much for joining us for today's exciting and hopefully informative episode of Astro Live with Intrepid Museum. My fabulous co-host, Elicia, will be hanging out with me here for the uh, hey sort of start of the show. And later, we are going to have a special guest. In like 25 minutes, 24 minutes actually, we're going to have a special guest from Lockheed Martin, the production manager for the Orion Heat Shield program. So big news in Artemis slash Orion slash splash down to the Pacific slash Jack Byer got aboard a boat and was taking pictures. We did a live stream on NSF's channel of that. And we are going to be talking. I see that. Oh, it was cool, wasn't it? <laughs> it was so cool. <laughs> um, we are going to be talking with the production manager who not only was involved with the creation of the heat shield that already flew around the moon, but also the creation of the next heat shield that will... If everything goes to plan, protect astronauts on the next Artemis mission. So that's coming up in like 23 minutes right now. To kick us off, though, we're going to do a little bit of a pre-show talking about a topic. Right, Alicia? Yeah, absolutely. So this month, we are super excited to be highlighting the Artemis 1 mission, which, of course, everyone had their eyes on all year long and finally 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 launched from kennedy space center in february in, uh, sorry, in florida <laughs> just last month uh in spectacular fashion uh it has been a really long road for our favorite giant orange rocket there but wow the payoff was amazing and so yeah before we talk with our special guest today i actually had a chance to attend all three launch attempts in person and i wanted to give you guys a quick behind the scenes look at some of the stuff that led up to that blaze of glory before Barry and Summer pick up the journey of the Orion capsule after, which of course came back recently too. Excellent. So I will uh, hand it over to you. I'll be hanging out as well, talking <laughs> about uh... Artemis. You just go with it. Yeah, you just go with All it. Right. <laughs> All right. So yeah, the first two attempts, guys, if you were following which I'm sure you were, of course. We're actually back in August and September. So August 29th, and then just a few days later, September 3rd. Um, I, I was invited down there through NASA Social and was there with reps from a whole bunch of other places too, like the Smithsonian. Uh, we had Harlem Globetrotters with us. We had photographers. Uh, even Chris Zembrowski from the Inspiration4 crew was there. Uh, it was so wild. He was so nice. Uh, even Snoopy, as you could see here, this is a picture of all of us with Snoopy in front of the time clock there. Snoopy, of course, being the zero-G indicator on Board the Orion capsule. So we got to hang out uh, with Snoopy a bit there and of course see lots of cool stuff. I also ran into some random guy who claimed he worked at NASA Space Flight. Really strange guy. He had he had a really strange name like Deuce or De da Deuce? Das, da what? Do you I think they're, oh, who's that? Do you recognize that guy? <laughs> Seriously? So he had a strange, <laughs> strange name like Deuce? 
That is, of course, Das, who we all know and love, this guy right here. Uh, so, yeah, it was really cool running into you, actually, who was on the, a secret mission there, actually, at the time. I think I mentioned this a couple months ago. He was I was. Those 24-7 cameras at the Cape for everyone. There's actually, uh, some me. of the work that I was doing is in the background of this shot. I just didn't tell anybody about it because uh, we were installing some of our robotic cameras at the Cape. And you can see the frame that I was installing in the background. Anyways, keep no. going. Oh, I felt so duped. I felt so duped. Aww. Anyway, um, we also got to meet with, I mean, amazing people. We met with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and Pamela Melroy. They talked about, um, you know, just the future plans of NASA, their plans to go to Mars and their different uh, ideas about how they're going to have, uh, you know, their propulsion systems in the future. Um, also, we talked to Jeremy Hansen and Joshua uh, Kutrick, who are astronauts with the Canadian Space Agency. One of those two guys is probably going to be on board the next mission, Artemis II, which is going to be extremely exciting to watch. So hearing about some of their training practices now ahead of that um, and just how excited Canada is to be involved in this as well. Um, and then we, of course, had the opportunity to hear from reps from pretty much every major partner in this collaboration. So people from Boeing and Northrop Grumman and, and Jacobs and uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne and Lockheed Martin, of course, which is how I met Barry Bonzak, who you will be hearing from about the Orion capsule in just a bit, who is absolutely great, by the way. The show is going to be a blast. He's really, really phenomenal. Um, and it was really just incredible to learn you know, just how much goes into this sort of thing. There are so many little components and there's just so much teamwork involved really um so it was it was incredible just hearing all of just the interesting components to the entire thing um from the rockets to uh you know the actual capsule itself and again barry will be telling more about that too we also heard from a ton of astronauts as well about their experiences and just some of the new technology that they're going to be using um they were in full force every astronaut i've ever known or heard of was there at the cape uh to see this amazing historic launch so on screen here we've got randy bresnick and Jessica Mir, they were there talking to us about spacesuits. Uh, so some of the differences in the next generation suits that they have and the differences, you know, between the orange ones that they wear inside of the capsule versus the white ones that they would wear out in space or on the moon as well. So we got to get an up close look at some of those. And then, of course, you know, we're there. They got to show us. They took us out to the pad to see Artemis in all of its glory. Um, I think I talked about visiting that a couple months ago as well. I mentioned those tan lines. You can see on the core stage there, that orange color with those rings, those lighter rings around it. Those are tan lines as the foam oxidizes in the sun and you know just the elements. So those have gotten a little bit darker. She'd been out there quite a bit longer since April, since last time I was there. Yep. I got them. <laughs> so really cool. Thank you. Yes, really cool to see that, of course. And then we got to go even closer to a crawler than I've ever been before. They let us just run wild we were under it and i love this picture this is actually just um a, a snapshot i took from a video that i shot for the intrepid just for social but i'm standing inside of the wheel of one of those crawlers there that gives you some perspective of just how big it is and it was filthy too i mean it was <laughs> covered in grease and dirt and you know we left there disgusting it was raining too so it got even worse there i am you, you but know yeah, I, yeah alicia you know funny story real quick this hole that's right by your hand uh -huh. Right? I don't know if it was this same dolly, whatever, the tread that it was, but I wanted to see what was inside of that hole, and I held my cell phone in oh, <laughs> and God. took a little video looking around, and I almost dropped my cell phone inside of that grease-filled hole. Uh, did not think that through in advance, but I was on a NASA social, and they let us run around the crawler mostly unsupervised. <laughs> yeah, that's how it was for us, too. We were like, seriously, I actually have a great shot. Maybe I shouldn't say this. I know a great shot of me. Uh, it was, again, it was filthy, but I actually it is. wrote, like, well, Alicia was here, and I had a picture of me being like, Look. In, like, so, the grime yeah. or grease or something? Yeah, vandalizing like, uh, government property. The great. crawler does. It is. It's absolutely anyway. greasy. Like, it's so, but the salt air down there and everything, they have to protect it. So, anyways, yeah. back to yeah. you. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, ultimately, uh, you know, end of the day, two scrubs. Oh, my gosh. They had to roll it back to the VAB to fix some issues. Then there was a hurricane and then they had to roll back to protect it. Then there was another hurricane and they kept it on the pad. And so everyone's sweating bullets. There's this like gajillion dollar project out there. And what happens if it gets hurt with the hurricane? So it was a little bit stressful these past few months, to say the least, um, you know, but eventually they were like, all right, hurricane is passed. We are going to proceed as planned in November. A little slight delay just to make sure everything was still good after that hurricane. 
But then, of course, of course, November 16th, the big day. So we all headed out there the night before in the evening. And the vibe was completely different. I have to say that first time we were out there, everyone was excited. You know, the vice president was there. You know, Jack Black was going to be on the broadcast. Oh, my it was, gosh. It was told to do, right? And then it got, you know, delayed. There was the, the Engine 3, you know, issue, right? Um, the second time, the vibe was not so happy. Everyone, so many less press showed up and everyone was just kind of like, I don't know, like it kind of needs to get rolled back. We don't know. And it was just sad. This last time, everyone was optimistic. Everyone was like, it's going this time. They are ready. They are prepared. It's going. There was just something electric in the air. There was just so much just excitement. And we all just felt like I, anyone I was asking, they were like, oh, it's totally going tonight. And so it was amazing. It did. Uh, of course, everything, though, as it was going along that night, came to a screeching halt when we got the news that they had stopped the flow of liquid hydrogen due to another leak. Oh, my God. That word, right? We were all freaking out. We didn't think it was going to happen. And Artemis can't get a break. So all these leak issues over and over, we're all terrified it's going to scrub again. Uh, we're all scared it's going to have to get rolled back to the VAB again, you know, rebooking all these flights and everything. Um, and all these questions, you know, how many more times can it even do that? How many more times could it roll back? And is there, you know, issues with the the stability of it and everything? So there's all these rumors flying around and we're getting little bits and pieces of information. And then we hear, wait, hang on. There are some packing nuts on the mobile launcher from the hydrogen valve that might be the problem. They look visibly loose. And all of a sudden we hear this word that they're sending out these people called the Red Crew. Now, if you're familiar with the Apollo days or even the shuttle program, you might recall reference to the Red Crew. They are called out to make quick repairs on extremely dangerous rocket equipment, um, especially when it's fully fueled up. And they went out to the pads during the shuttle countdowns and probably most famously prior to that and, and everything really, NASA had to send out the Red Crew during the countdown of Apollo 11, that famous mission to the moon in 1969. And similar to this, they also had to tighten some bolts and repair a leak uh, for the Saturn V rocket, which was at that time, the most powerful rocket ever. So what's really ironic about this one, uh, or that one rather, is that it also had to do with a valve for replenishing liquid hydrogen. And that one was a real nail biter too. They actually had to troubleshoot a lot of it and they had to get really creative. They were actually out there, there's records of them pouring water on the valve to try to warm it up. And um, that was helping. And they noted that uh, they were literally taking off their hard hats and filling them up with water from the emergency shower um, and tossing it onto the valve. But ultimately they decided to bypass the faulty valve, use another one. And then of course they went to the moon. But these guys are really, really brave. All right. So first of all, um, you know, they're always on standby and ideally they'll never have to do their job. But just in case they are there to zip out to the pad around this extremely dangerous, fully fueled up and ready to explode vehicle to fix something. And SLS, of course, was the most powerful rocket to ever launch. You have to understand, right? Look at this picture. This thing is 322 feet tall. It was loaded up with three quarters of a million pounds of highly combustible hydrogen fuel and liquid oxygen. And this is dangerous stuff, right? They have to go out there, get up close and personal with it to stick a little wrench on a tiny piece of hardware right next to it. And it's all come down to this, no pressure, right? I would be sweating bullets. I don't know about you guys, but unbelievably, yeah, these three guys, um, Billy Cairns, Trent Annis, um, who are the two cryogenic engineering technicians, and then Chad Garrett, the safety engineer, they all work for NASA. Um, they work for, or rather, they work for a NASA partner called Jacobs. Um, they manage the ground operations around Kennedy. They flew out there uh, to the pad 39B. They spent about an hour out there at the base of the rocket fix the problem. And later they were actually brought into the NASA broadcast uh, as heroes, right? They saved the day. <laughs> they said they were really excited, but they also were very confident. They were very focused and they were ready to just get up there and use their training and go. Yeah. And Cairns, um, I don't know if you have that picture of all of them standing with um, uh, Bill Nelson again. I do. One, so one thing really quickly, the yeah. craziest thing about all this, I mean, we knew they're trained to go out there and do it, but NASA showed it on yeah, the stream. Is yeah, like that could have cameras yeah. of the team driving up to the rocket. No, we were all flabbergasted. We never thought that NASA would show the vans pulling up and people getting out and da -da 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 up to the fueled rocket. But NASA showed it. I don't know. I don't remember that they showed this specific picture, but they did show live video of the team approaching the pad. You wanted the yeah. picture of them with stuff, right? Uh, the, them with uh, Bill Nelson. Got it. So I can highlight them again. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so the guy all the way on the left, that is uh, Karen's, right? So he had actually served on this crew for 37 years, okay? And he had never been called in to handle anything like this before. And again, ideally, 
you know, you shouldn't be, right? Ideally, we don't want you to have to go out and do something. But can you imagine being in a job, ready to go, waiting for that call, literally for 37 years, just sitting there waiting for your big oh, moment. And then, of course, it comes, and it's, like, the biggest, most important one of your lifetime and, like, all of humanity's lifetime as we start, you know, going out to the moon again and, like, everything is riding on this. Like, I can't even imagine. These guys are, are just heroes. They're amazing. Um, but, yeah, something else that I, I do really want to point out is that they said that they felt like the rocket was alive while they were out there. It's creaking. It's making these venting noises. It's pretty scary, right? Um, and that's actually something that we hear a lot from astronauts and technicians that are out there on the pad next to active rockets, that these things feel like they sound like they're alive. It's so cool, right? Um, but they said as soon as they walked up those stairs, you know, they were ready to, as they said, rock and roll. They were ready to go. These guys are brilliant. So ultimately, yes, they were able to resolve the leak. The countdown continued and the mega moon rocket successfully blasted off at 1.47 a.m. after only a 43 minute delay. And so it made the window and, you know, took its trip out to the moon. So I say bravo. Amazing to this red crew, right? But it also made me think of something else. So the topic of this red crew, for a lot of people, this was the first time they might have ever heard heard of these people before this team and that is actually um kind of a little bit more confusing you know as you were saying they pulled it up on the stream um you could see them pull up in their white vans and they were dressed in their dark blue outfits and everyone's like come on now so you could have at least given them some like red shirts red, or something. no red shirts no red then, shirts course, is a... yeah you've got all the star trek fans yeah. and we're like no maybe don't give them red shirts because we all know what happens to the red shirts right so a lot of people that were wondering why are they called the red crew and what's funny is that I have a theory about this. And I say theory because I was actually that weirdo running around the press site while this was all going on and asking all of these NASA people if they knew why are they called the red team or the red crew? And no one had an answer for me too, which is pretty funny. So until someone does disprove me, I have a very strong theory about this and I think I might be right. So in the Navy, the flight deck of the aircraft carrier is, of course, the most dangerous place to work. It is noisy. There, depending on what era it was, lots of propellers or lots of jets. There's lots of busy planes zipping, you know, in and out through all kinds of weather, through day and night. So having visual cues on what's going on and where people are and what they're up to is really helpful. So on carriers, just like the Intrepid, hey, uh, who did have this too while they were in service, up on the flight deck, you've got lots of people working in different teams and they wear different colored jerseys to designate their jobs kind of like sports teams so this is still in practice today you can see this picture here with rainbow colors they call them the skittles actually because they are wearing many different colors um they're easy to spot uh and so you know you think about things like all right if they're wearing yellow well those are actually the aircraft handlers so they literally direct the planes around the flight deck and um it makes sense if they're yellow right they're very easy to see um, you know, immediately the yellow. Um, you've also got the the purple ones, right? So they are there to help to fuel up the planes. They actually have the nickname of the grapes because they juice up the planes, right? So that makes sense. Well, on aircraft carriers, you also have a red team. And these are the guys who are the ordnance handlers. So they are the ones that deal with explosives and the bombs and the ammunitions. And they are highly trained to work with this stuff to help to defuse, you know, hazardous situations. Um, and they're also in charge of firefighting and damage control should the need arise. Um, and I think there's some pictures in there actually too of from our archives of the people on the Intrepid on the red team. Do you have those? Yep. Here they come, here they come. I know we're all waiting. There we it's go. It's opening. Uh, so there we go. So look at these guys from, you know, from our archives. All right. This is your old pictures um, from these guys that are up there. They're wearing their red and they're handling these missiles, right, that go on the planes. And I actually kind of love the one on the right, too, because you see those four holes and it's like, like oh, it's like, it's like the engines, right? So they're out there, you know, on comms saying, oh, they're sending out this red team. And my brain instantly makes that connection. I'm like, yeah, of course they are. These are the guys trained to work with extremely dangerous explosives. And I think that's where it comes from. And it actually does make a lot of sense because there is a very rich historical overlap with the Navy and the space program, right? They've been involved in so many recoveries throughout history. Of course, the Intrepid picked up too. I have to say that uh, more astronauts you know have come from the Navy than any other branch, which is also something that you know during the Army Navy game recently they were plugging. Of course, the Navy had their special NASA you know branded uh, football outfits, their football uniforms and stuff, which was pretty cool too. I think even though they lost. So ultimately, though, at the end of the day, 
yes, you all know what happened. The red team saved the day. All right. We had a glorious launch. It was absolutely unreal if you were there in person. Um, there's so many videos of it over uh, all over the place. Um, it was it was incredible, truly. Like it was so bright. It was brighter than, of course, any other, you know, Falcon 9 or something else that goes up. Um, it lit up the sky like it was daylight. It was incredible. It was just flawless. And I was a little surprised. I thought it would be a little bit louder than it was, but <laughs> uh -oh. their noise suppression system was banging. Like they had so much water, you know, coming out that it actually was, was I think, I think, and I've heard this from other people too. I think it was actually softer than, softer is, you know, like obviously it wasn't soft, but it was quieter than um, I think like a Falcon 9 launch, to be honest, even with all of that power still. Are you but sure it, was it wasn't just relatively quieter? <laughs> I, well, yeah, it was relatively quieter to that. But what was loud was everyone around me. All right. Because we were screaming our, you know, butts off because we were so excited. Um, I'm sure, you know, you were hearing everyone's reactions on NSF because I'm sure everyone was listening to NSF while this was going on. I think I've got uh, and, that. You know, there were tears. There were just screams of excitement. There was jumping up and down. Like it was, everyone was so, so excited. Um, I think my favorite video, though, is, yes, the one that I took. Um, I was standing right. <laughs> Right next to Chris Gebhardt, uh, right up by the time clock. Please. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Yeah! Oh, it's totally muffling the sound for me, but hopefully people can hear this. <laughs> so, can y'all hear Chris squealing? Oh I don't hear it. Can, can everyone in chat hear it? I don't know if they can hear it. Chad will tell me if they can't hear it. The chat is laughing, but I don't know if Zoom is trying to clean oh, this up. Okay. I'm reading it. Okay, oh. wait. Okay, so I, I had to wait to play that because I knew as soon as I started playing it, it would be ridiculously loud. So, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so I, and I posted that you know on my Twitter as well. If anyone wants to to rewatch it a million times, it just it just brings me so much joy because I mean. Chris, first of all, is just so much joy. He is pure joy embodied. And it was just so neat, too, after everything this year, you know, with us being able to broadcast with you guys and, you know, doing all the Astro Live shows, it was just so neat to be able to experience that right next to all the NSF guys there, too, at the press site. And it was just really special. It was so, so wonderful. And it's something I will never, ever forget. I I, I was getting teary-eyed. And then, honestly, it was really starting to hit me, like, the next day, even, that yeah. this happened. I really kept thinking, oh, yeah, of course, there's a big orange rocket down at the launch pad because it was always there. It just, you know, was a permanent fixture of NASA these days. So it's not there anymore, guys. Uh, yeah. It's gone. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So it was, you know, and it was incredible. And then, of course, this past month, being able to watch the journey of Orion, right, and see just that incredible um, historical journey, really. It went further than anyone has ever gone before. Uh, or any, I guess I'd say, human-rated <sighs> spacecraft. Rated to before. continue carrying humans to this position. There's like a couple caveats in there because Apollo yeah. ascent module, whatever, <laughs> right? But uh... I'm sure Barry will be able to clarify this better later on. Uh, but just seeing that, just seeing the technology and knowing that the next time this thing goes up, there's going to be people on it, which is even more exciting. So, yeah, in a nutshell, that was kind of some of the lead up. There was definitely a roller coaster of emotions yeah. going on there. You know, is it going? Isn't it going? What's going on? And then just, oh, that cathartic release of all that fire in the sky. It was just like, <laughs> yes, we did it. Like, we were all surprised that it went. Like, we were, oh. we thought, oh, so it's going to scrub. Oh, it's going to get, okay. It's going to get oh. to two hours and scrub. There's going to be a leak. Okay, red team, Even whatever. Though we all, again, in the air, everyone was like, it's going, it's going. Once it actually hit that, like, T minus 10, everyone was just like, hold, I was holding my breath. I and, I and as it was going up, I hate saying this too, but I was still holding my breath. Yep. As I'm watching it go up, I'm like, please keep going, please keep going, please keep going. <laughs> And it did. And everyone, you know, was saying it was it was flawless, you know, when it actually did go, which is great. That's what we needed. So I, I can't hooray, believe hooray Artemis. Hooray everything. I mean, it was just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience. Yeah, I, I can't believe we got those views from around the moon, like the spacecraft going around the moon and then like a live stream of it passing the moon. And then it's like, oh, we're going to lose signal, of course, because the moon's going to be in the way. And you see the Earth getting right to the, to the edge of the moon. And then, of course, we lost signal because the moon's in the way. Like just the whole oh. thing was absolutely amazing. 
Yeah, they really did a spectacular job. And then seeing all the views from inside, too. And, you know, see, hearing about Callisto, which I'm sure he'll talk about. Snoopy and, going past. You know, seeing, seeing Snoopy floating around. Yep. And Sean the Sheep for everyone, you know, who, who's over in Europe, too, who loves them. I mean, it was, yeah, it was really, really great. Yep. So, yeah, it was great. <sighs> All right. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to take up any more time. I want to be able to, you know, hand you guys over uh, to to Barry and Summer. Um, but I just want to say, you know, on behalf of Intrepid, we are so excited to keep bringing you more amazing shows in the new year. Uh, we're actually going to be changing up the format just a bit as we head, you know, through 2023, but nothing, nothing, you know, wild. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, but more great content on a number of really amazing topics we've got planned with some super cool guests coming up in the new year. Yep. Uh, but first, of course, Barry, before I get ahead of my myself um so yeah happy holidays everyone have a great new year and have a wonderful uh astro live all right alicia thank you so much um folks we often do a little bit of a pre-show here to talk about a related topic or something that might be one of the things we're changing next year we may hop straight to the special guests uh but again we've slightly changed the name a little bit it's astro live this is the intrepid museum's monthly show if you're watching it on the nasa spaceflight youtube channel it's because we've partnered nasa spaceflight has partnered with intrepid to bring you all these special guests and discussions and stuff like that once per month and alicia as well to, to bring you alicia um <laughs> and i sneak into nsf's world sometimes it's too, true. Just on the SWAT launch. The SWAT launch, yeah. Made a special little appearance in the Starship one, too, that yep. no one was expecting. <laughs> but remember, the Astro Live shows don't just magically happen. Uh, they are made possible through a NASA cooperative agreement awarded to the New York Space Grants Consortium. So thank you so much for the support. And thank you all for showing up and experiencing these things, these things with us. What I'm going to do now... I can't do that. I'd, I'd mess it up. It would look like an asteroid or something. Um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to hop off real quick. There's a really quick video that we're going to replace next year about in programs that are happening at the Intrepid Museum. When we come back, we will have the production manager from Lockheed Martin of the Orion Heat Shield and other things uh, to talk about producing the heat shield that went around the moon and what they're going to do with that heat shield next. And what about the next heat shield? the one that's supposed to go up on the next Orion with astronauts on board. So let me do this. We're going to do this little uh, transition video while I get our special guest in here. Alicia, thank you so much for joining us. It is always a pleasure. And when we come always back, a pleasure. we'll have right. the special guest from... You guys in the new year. Yep. Have fun. All right. Thanks, Alicia. We'll have the special guest from Lockheed Martin coming up next. Don't go anywhere, y'all. We'll be right back. Okay. Mic check. Hey, that's the wrong. It helps if you unmute the video and not mute yourself, viewers. Every year, more than a million visitors embark on a voyage of discovery at Intrepid, a museum on board an aircraft carrier devoted to the intersection of history, science, innovation, and service. They come to the museum to learn, to explore, to engage, and to see firsthand the artifacts that marked critical moments in history and spark our future. They are up close and personal with living history, learning about the past, while contemplating the possibilities of tomorrow through 21st century technology. Within intrepid steel walls are moments, a sense of wonder when a student sees history come alive, goosebumps when a memory is sparked, and understanding when a returning service member connects with a fellow veteran. But Intrepid's reach extends far beyond this great carrier's steel walls and decks. Every day, it is making a difference in the lives of so many, in our immediate neighborhood and all around the world. Intrepid also brings learning experiences to students participating in CASA, New York City's cultural after-school adventures program throughout its five boroughs. Designed to support the diverse needs of learners in New York City public schools, Intrepid's CASA programs integrate history, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math into out-of-school time experiences to help build in-school success. Our VET video chats reconnect veterans with the legacy of service. My name is Charlotte, and I'm really happy to be connecting with you all. And these are artifacts that are related to work, but also to leisure. We are a ship of ideas sailing forth to communities near and far, to schools, libraries, housing projects, senior centers, correctional facilities, veterans centers, and children's hospitals to engage and inspire those who can't come to us.
All right, folks. Have I unmuted the correct microphone? I think I did this time. I just clicked on the wrong little icon, and uh, that's okay. <sighs> let me know if you can hear me just fine, and let me know if you can see. I've brought in Summer Ash and our special guest, Barry Bonsack, waiting for some 5 by 5s over here. It's a super small production team, slash just me, making all this happen. Summer, Barry, how are you all doing today? Hello, doing good. How are you? I'm good. Y'all hear Summer? Okay, Barry, how are you doing? Merry Artemis. I got my Mary. NASA Artemis sweater here with everyone. There we go. Merry Artemis. Oh, it disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Artemis. So we are now going to talk with Barry here. Summer Ash is going to be our moderator asking some questions. If you've got questions for us, make sure you tag us in chat. You can tag at NASA Spaceflight. You can put question into one of the other streams. Wherever you're asking questions from, I will get them, but I am going to turn it over to Summer and Barry here. All right. Thank you, Doss. I think Barry's already won the event with his <laughs> so We can all go home now, right? make a real Artemis Christmas sweater. I'll buy it. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I would, I would buy three at least. Um, welcome, Barry. Uh, I just want to give a quick uh, spiel, a little overview of you for everybody on the event today. So Barry is a production planner for Lockheed Martin's Orion spacecraft which is the crew module that is going to return astronauts to the moon um, and has recently splashed down. Um, Barry is on the thermal protection system team at Kennedy Space Center, where the Orion crew service module is assembled and tested. And he also supports Lockheed Martin state and local government relations and is engaged in STEM education through uh, first robotics competition, which is very exciting. I'm a big fan of that. Um, before we get into all of the Orion coolness, I actually just wanted to ask you how you got interested in science and space to begin with. What's your oh, origin sure. story? Sure. I mean, the origin story was I was a high school student in the first robotics competition to start with. Okay. Uh, and I actually moved from Oklahoma to Florida. And growing up in Oklahoma, I never even considered, you know, space exploration a career possibility. Uh, but then I met uh, through the first robotics competition, going to events and uh, Lockheed Martin people mentoring uh, the team that I was working with. Um, well, I got my foot in the door at Lockheed Martin, but I also learned about uh, the Kennedy Space Center was nearby. And uh, then when I went to uh, college, I went to the University of Central Florida, also known as Space U. And yeah. my college job was working at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex as an educator. So I was one of the Camp Kennedy Space Center counselors uh, teaching kids about space history and something called the uh, Constellation Program, which was brand new at the time. So right. that, that solidified my love for space flight. Yeah, you were totally in on the ground floor there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was able to uh, watch shuttle launches with oh. students, and I got to see the Ares 1X roll out. Uh, but, but really getting into Lockheed Martin, I got to think, uh, I was mentoring – uh, a robotics team called Exploding Bacon in Orlando. They're sponsored by Lockheed Martin. Uh, the mentors, including Ryan Leach and Mike Nicholas, Sarah Plemons, were mentors of that team. And as I got closer to my graduation at UCF, which, by the way, is a finance major, I want to put that out now. Um, and okay. I was an MBA at later on. Uh, but they're like, have you started applying to internships yet? And I said, no, I probably should. And they're like, yeah, you should do that like tomorrow. Uh, here's a link. So the, really, they were the ones that helped get me my foot in the door at Lockheed Martin, and I've been a part of uh, the company since 2009. I've uh, been on the Orion program since 2014, about one month before the launch of Exploration Flight Test 1. Uh, and I just, I, I, I actually interviewed on the Orion program just because I was so excited about space flight. Um, and I just wanted an interview so I could go in the building and take a tour. <laughs> <laughs> so Artemis 1 was really my first launch that put something into space. I've been on the program since 2014. And it was just a beautiful launch. But I told people I wasn't going to listen to any Christmas. It's too early to listen to Christmas music until I saw the three main parachutes. So we just had <laughs> a big party watching reentry uh, last Sunday. We all got together at a local sports bar on a Sunday morning. And people were coming in for NFL. But, like, we owned half the restaurant uh, before Brady's and Coco. They hosted us. It was great. People were cheering for the TVs. And they're like, who got a touchdown? We're just like, parachutes! <laughs> <laughs> That would have been really fun to see. Um, so let's talk about Artemis One and your role in uh, Orion. So can you just give a brief summary sort of, of what Orion is and what it just did as Absolutely. part of the first launch? 
So the NASA Artemis program is the program that's going to send astronauts uh, back to the moon with a longer duration stays and an ar architecture that's going to be unlike the Apollo program where we'll be able to go to uh, north, and, north and south poles of the moon, unlike the equator that the Apollo did. We're going to send uh, the astronaut core is more diverse today than it was back in the 1960s 1970s so there'll be multiple nationalities and diversity and uh, the first woman astronaut will walk on the moon and on uh, artemis 3 uh so a lot of firsts and exciting times ahead for us uh the orion spacecraft will be the uh, spacecraft that the astronauts get on top of the sls rocket and fly themselves to what will eventually be the lunar gateway which is behind me here's the orion spacecraft behind me in my uh uh, background here and on the other side is uh, the gateway which will be an international partnership multiple commercial companies working together to build this outpost around the moon similar but not like the international space station smaller but it does have a power and propulsion element meaning it can change its own orbit around the moon which will give when orion arrives there uh the lunar landing system will be already docked there autonomously astronauts will get out of orion into the gateway and then depending on where they put the orbit around uh the moon Astronauts will descend to the lunar surface on the human landing system, and it is going to be some amazing missions up ahead. Artemis 1 was the first uncrewed mission around the moon. Artemis 2 and 3 are already in work at the Kennedy Space Center, and uh, those will both have crew in them. So lots and lots of exciting things coming. Uh, my specific role, I am a production planner for the thermal protection system. Uh, that means I work with the engineers, the technicians, and the supply chain to basically build the schedule for the start and finish of uh, what's now Artemis 3 and 4 uh, to build the heat shield. Oh, and I'm still working on 2. The Artemis 2 heat shield hasn't been installed yet. So I'm working 2, 3, and 4 pretty much all right now at the same time uh, to work on the heat shield. Uh, the back shells, which we'll show some pictures of. There you go. That's a picture yeah. of the two uh, tile uh, of help bonding blocks complete. Uh, so that is that picture was taken July 2020. So it's coming along much further than that. We're getting pretty close to installation uh, early next year for that heat shield. Um, and so I read that this heat shield and this mission, or in general, returning from the moon, is a such a higher energy process than coming back from low earth orbit and so that the requirements of the thermal protection system are that much greater can you talk a little bit more about that yeah you're you're absolutely correct so the requirements to build a spacecraft that goes to and from the moon are very different than the requirements for a spacecraft that goes to the international space station or to hubble or just be in low earth orbit uh when you go to orbit, you need to be able to go 17,500 miles per hour. That is the speed spacecrafts travel to in order to stay around the Earth without falling back. Now, if you want to go beyond Earth orbit, that means you have to reach the escape velocity, which is over 24,000 miles per hour, which means when you come back, unless you've used some energy propulsion to slow yourself down, you're going to be hitting the atmosphere at 24,000 miles per hour. So that means it is going to be much, much hotter. The friction against the uh, spacecraft will be much hotter than it would on a spacecraft that's coming back from the International Space Station, per se. Right. And that's, um, like, I read 73% hotter. I mean, that's a lot. Hotter. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. And I think we have got some uh, images. Do you want to start talking about back shells? Or you want to talk about uh, heat shield? Let's talk about back shells. How about so, back shells? <laughs> <laughs> back shells are good. Uh, you saw an image earlier of the heat shield. These are the back shells. I've got one here with me. Let me grab it. Oh, cool. Of course All you right. do. Go and tell yeah. item. Uh, this is very similar to what they used on the space shuttle program. It okay. is a black tile. If you go to any of the, uh, the museums that have a shuttle in, including uh, Intrepid Air and Space Museum there in New York City. Uh, we have one in Los Angeles was where Endeavor is. The Discovery's at... Uh, Washington, D.C. at the Dulles Air and Space Museum, and Atlantis is at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. Nice. So if you go underneath uh, those space shuttles and look up, you're going to see that it is completely black underneath. And that is not just one solid black frame. It's made up of many, many tiles. In fact, 10,000 of them on the space shuttle because that is one of the hottest parts of the uh, of the shuttle. It, the orbiter came back at an attack velocity, yeah. uh, attack angle about like this. And there you go. There's another great picture. That's our forward bay cover. And uh, those 10,000 tiles basically help make sure that the hottest part of the space shuttle, not counting the leading edge of the wing and the uh, nose cone, that was reinforced carbon carbon, that was the hottest part, but next would be the bottom of the space shuttle. And the way that it works is that this is actually very, very light. 
Um, it is 90% air, and then the rest of it is kind of a silicon makeup that is uh, kind of like glass, tempered glass that they uh have a big goopy silicon mess put it in a, a block and cool it down and it crystallizes on the inside to where it's very hard for heat to go from one side to the other but when it's in space all that air gets sucked out and there's a vacuum inside so if anyone here is uh taking their uh their classes back in high school remembering science class heat doesn't ha has a few ways to transfer and it can't transfer without a medium so the medium on the right. inside is uh this very torturous path so heat's on the outside doesn't make it to the other side so the astronauts are just protected by a very thin layer of the thermal protection system and that's what worked for the space shuttle program and they got the uh, very well down on how to do that and that worked great for orion for the not hottest parts because uh the hottest part of the uh, spacecraft is of course the heat shield the bottom the bulkhead because it comes down at an angle uh, a little bit angled uh and it gets so hot coming in that 24,000 miles per hour that this would melt. So you are not going to be able to use this exact same thing that you would on the space shuttle because the space shuttle would melt coming in at that, uh, at that speed. So we had to go with what they did back in the Apollo Gemini Mercury program, which is something called Avcoat. And you're showing a little bit earlier of how the Apollo uh, heat shields were being made. And this is a special substance that is ablative. So the space shuttle was made to be reusable, so those blocks were reusable. An ablative heat shield means that it burns away as it's coming in. And you're asking about how hot does it get, and the answer is, yeah, it gets about half the uh, temperature of the sun or twice the temperature of uh, hot lava in Hawaii. Uh, 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit is what this has to withstand, while those uh, the space shuttle got up to somewhere between three and 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So over 1,000 degrees hotter is what the requirements of this heat shield has to do. And what you're looking at here is an Apollo picture of them assembling uh, a heat shield, and it's a, basically a giant honeycomb dome, and those caulk guns that you have around there have the Avcoat material in it, and the technicians surround the, surrounded the heat shield and inserted the Avcoat uh, material inside each little crevice of the, of the honeycomb structure. So that is how they did it in the Apollo program. And we've completely revamped this process uh, to improve it for uh, Artemis 1 was the first time that we had it. But I'll show you uh, if you have the next picture from Exploration Flight Test 1. I'm not sure if you do or don't. Do you have the EFT-1 heat shield pictures? If not, we'll skip on to... We, we did something kind of similar, except for we had a robotic arm. Let's just put it that... There we go. We had the same honeycomb structure. We fill it up. That is actually EFT-1, the installation of the heat shield on EFT-1. Uh, Exploration Flight Test 1 flew in 2014. I mentioned that earlier. Just want to make sure everyone knows the difference. Uh, full Orion spacecraft went uh, 10 times further away than the National Space Station. Uh, now resides at the Kane Space Center Visitor Complex in the new Gateway exhibit. So if you want to see an Orion spacecraft on display, you got to go to the Visitor Complex. It's the only one on display, flown, flown spacecraft. Uh, Artemis 1 is a little bit different, though. Here we go. Here's the Artemis 1 heat shield. Uh, and you can see that there are blocks on it, very similar to the blocks that I just showed you for the TPS tiles. We're now using blocks of Avcoat. So I've got one of those here with me as well. Uh, so these are thick and they burn away. And one of the great things about this process is that we can uh, scan it. We can uh, scan for any imperfections. We can weigh it. We can know exactly how much each block should weigh and scan for imperfections before we install it onto the spacecraft. And if there's any uh, quality problems or it's something that we can have a new one remade or uh, uh, or we can be at least be able to know what the weight and center of gravity is of the heat shield by itself. So if you just go with the caulk gun and fill up each individual hole, then, you know there's some imperfections in the right. process of doing that uh, because we're human. And you could never really know exactly where the center of gravity is of that uh, heat shield doing it that process. So this is yeah. a – also it, it sped up how fast we can build a heat shield by doing it this way. How thick is that? This is just a, a – this isn't a real block. This is just a test one. Uh, the real answer is I can't answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> um, it's thick. It, it, it's pretty darn thick compared yeah. to uh, a tile. It's also weighs more than the tile does. Because it. essentially the tile is mostly air, like I mentioned. This thing's solid all the way through, and it burns right. away layer by layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And this is like the world's largest heat shield, right? So far. Yeah. To... Yeah. 
Throwing it back to the Canadian Space Center Visitor Complex, there's another, if, if you go to their Journey to Mars exhibit, there's mm -hmm. an Orion model heat shield. It's a fake heat shield, but it's a Orion model of a heat shield. And inside of it shows the circle. This was the size of the Apollo heat shields. And then another circle inside, this was the size of the Gemini. And another one, uh, this is the size. So you can actually see how large the heat shields have gotten over the period of, since 1961 was the first uh, mm -hmm. Alan Shepard's launch with Mercury right. uh, capsules. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so the first one has come in and has ablated all of that stuff that's burned yep. off and splashed down. Where is it now? Can you say that? Yeah, sure. It's still uh, in San Diego. That just okay. was loaded off the uh, USS Portland. Uh, fantastic work to uh, ground ops and to uh, the Navy and everyone that helped go retrieve that spacecraft. There you go. Beautiful picture of it. Um, and really cool thing you can actually see the black tiles on here which it looks different than the day that we put it into on top of the sls we put the fairings around i think we probably have pictures of that later on but um you can notice that there's a a lot of little white marks on there and you can a lot of things that like immediately people ask about when they see this they see those uh giant balloons on top and they see all the little white marks and those are like the most common questions so we can kind of get into that a little bit so uh, i have pictures of them barry thanks to Even jack more, oh, look at those roll <laughs> thrusters there so you can actually look at the propulsion system those roll th thrusters there and you can see that around the thrusters is actually a another type of thermal protection system uh but yeah those little squares is uh they went over uh the the silver tape that we put on top of the uh thermal blocks and that was helped with esd so if there's any esd it basically uh, esd made, um sorry static static discharge electric static discharge it made sure that um if there was any electric type events uh it would discharge it away from the crew module by the way, uh, the images that I'm showing here, these were previously members-only images that Jack took while he was out on the ship. And I asked Jack very nicely if we could release some of the member program, uh, NASA Spaceflight member program images here. So these like extreme close-ups and stuff, Barry, uh, those are from Jack from that stream, that visit he did out to the Portland. How cool, man. And you can see very well that these, each one of those is an individual tile that makes up the back shells. Uh, that surround the vehicle and underneath those back shells uh, is where our propulsion system is our environmental control life support system and underneath that that's still considered the outer mold and underneath that is the uh, pressure vessel and behind the paint of the pressure vessel are astronauts and the distance between astronaut face and the where you're looking at there like maybe a few feet and then on the other side of that plasma 5,000 degrees <laughs> no big deal no big deal <laughs> And so those ESD, those little patches, um, they would have had those on Apollo, like for when that, um, which whichever one it was that got struck by lightning twice, I or did they not they have those back then? This is new for the Orion spacecraft, but I actually don't know that for Apollo. No worries. Just and curious. you can see the windows there. Those are the, we're looking at what we call panel F. It's the Batman face of the Orion spacecraft. <laughs> Uh, and that is a thermal protection window. So there's multiple panes of window there. And the most outer one is the thermal protection uh, window pane. What's that? What's um, special about that? Or what do you guys do to that outer pane? For the... uh, it's made differently uh, so it can withstand the heat of reentry. It doesn't melt. Yeah, always. That's a good thing. <laughs> hey, and then the <laughs> other one would be the pressure pane that holds the oxygen inside of the spacecraft. And okay. it's mul multiple pane. Uh, so that way, if there happened to be a crack in one or the other, it wouldn't lose pressure. Yeah. Hey, Barry, I've got a question real quick, if I could. And just stare at the camera knowingly if you can't answer it. Why is this so clean right here? Yeah, so that's where the phased array antenna is. Uh, and the phased array antenna, you're going to notice there's no satellite dishes on the Orion spacecraft, but we're receiving imagery uh, back and forth uh, from the spacecraft, even after disconnecting from the service module. So the phased array antenna is... Uh, basically where you can direct signal without actually moving the antenna. Um, it's, I believe, made by Ball in uh, in Colorado. And, yeah, that's where the antenna goes. So you don't want to put uh, anything in front of your antenna. Gotcha. Okay, cool. There's like there's no, it, like the, the foil and the tape and like all that, you don't see any of that there, but that's so that the antenna has a clear shot to do antenna things, RF things. Right. You got it. Nice. Thank you. Antenna things. That's the technical antenna thing. Antenna things, you know. Antenna things. A lot of questions that have often popped up about those crew module uprighting system bags, CMOS, 
And basically those uh, bags would inflate if we happen to land on our side or if we landed upside down. You have a stable one or stable two. The spacecraft either wants to be floating upright or it wants to be floating upside down. Um, and if it happened to land in any direction that wasn't upright, it did land upright. But if it didn't, those bags would inflate and then immediately flip the... There you go. Oh, <laughs> I got it. By some technology that we have here, video editing technology, you can see what a stable <laughs> two would look like. Uh, those bags would flip the spacecraft upright. And multiple reasons why you want to do that. One, because there's going to be astronauts inside of here, and it takes a little bit of time to do the recovery effort, and they don't really want to be sitting upside down the entire time. But that's one reason. Uh, the other reason is that the oxygen is inside the service module. So when you disconnect from the uh, service module and start returning back to Earth, we do have oxygen tanks inside of the crew module, but eventually those will run out too after you re-enter. And let's say uh, the there was a strong wave or you know some inclement weather or something would occur that would make it more difficult to recover than other. You want to be able to have the backup plan. So there is a snorkel that is out of the top of the spacecraft. So it can pull in outside air into the crew cabin for the astronauts to breathe, but that doesn't work if the astronauts are upside down in the water. So extremely important to be able to flip them upright, one for comfort, but two for astronauts have this pesky thing that they want to breathe. I, robots don't need that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Barry, we should hang out more, honestly. Robots <laughs> don't need that. Let's talk about mosquitoes, too. Robots don't complain about mosquitoes. They don't care if it's, like, radiation or, you know, <laughs> two, 300 degrees uh, plus or minus Fahrenheit. You know, they, they, robots don't care about anything. They could go all the way out to Pluto and back, and they've never complained a bit. Oh, God. You've, not read, you've clearly not taken iRobot to heart, have you? <laughs> So you guys want to talk a little bit more about this? We've kind of showed that. Yeah, so, yeah. Show the film. You were talking yeah. about how Barry. We will talk about whatever you want to talk about. You just, right, you uh, just run with it. Just run. <laughs> just keep talking. That gives me the opportunity for you not to ask me questions I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I see this plan. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So this little bit of tape right there. That yeah. is the tape. So if you have any pictures of the uh, Artemis One crew module before it came in for reentry, it was plenty shiny. Uh, and very reflective tape. Uh, it's called Psyox tape, and basically it has multiple functions. One being, obviously, it will reflect uh, the sun away. Uh, so that way, when it's in direct sunlight, it will reflect some of the heat and radiation away. Uh, but also, it is an insulator. So on the back side of spacecraft, or when you're on the far side of the moon, when there's no sunlight, uh, these blocks could become really brittle if they get too cold. So the uh, tape itself will insulate the heat that's already in there inside and keep it from getting too cold and brittle and possibly uh, possibly get impacted. Let's say a really brittle tile, if it were to get a uh, micrometeorite strike, could crack. And you don't want that. So this helps protect uh, that from happening. Hey, Barry, help me out real quick. Which is the backside of the spacecraft? Am I looking at the front side or the backside here? Sure. And sure. <laughs> what, when you say front, we, we call it forward and aft. Right. The aft side is the heat shield. The forward side is the docking tunnel. So this is the forward side I'm looking at. You're looking at the forward side. So if you say the back side of the spacecraft, you're talking about the heat shield side. Yeah, and that you're right, front and back. So I also consider, when I say front and back, I sometimes refer to back as the not window side. I consider the windows to kind of be forward side. So you're also looking at the windows there. So I really should, you. we kind of use port and starboard actually on the spacecraft as well. <laughs> Um, no, it's it's so, all good. Like I, I, you you said, oh, the backside of the spacecraft, and I was like, do I have a picture? Which is the backside? Because if you <laughs> if you and if you picture like, hang on, I think I got it. Yeah, here we go. Like that's, when yeah, that, that is the aft side of the service module you're looking at that. Uh, yeah, looking at. But then it does this and it flips around. Yes, it right? does. It literally. <laughs> hang on, I, I could just play this <laughs> animation. I think there, there's something like. Yeah, that's a sweet picture. That's a sweet video. I think there's something like 45 engines total on the propulsion system on the wow. uh, on the spacecraft if you include the service module. This is what got me. Like now, is this forward and this no, is aft? No, nope. that will it's still be aft. The field is aft. Okay. Yeah. So exactly. even though it's going in first, it is the aft side of the spacecraft that goes in first. You're correct. Gotcha. Like Thank you. Feet first. Yes, like feet dumping first. in feet first. Okay. <laughs> you got it. That's that good. good analogy. We <laughs> even called the, the heat shield goes on what's called the aft bulkhead of the pressure vessel. Gotcha. No, okay. No, I, I, no, no bow and stern here. 
Yeah, we, are, yeah, we do. We do say port and starboard. Exactly. <laughs> oh and my how gosh. do you determine that? Where's the mid? Like it's just the midline of the cruise facing forward, and then it's yeah. So the zero degree would be the window side. The side with the windows on it is zero degree. Got it. Um, and then port would be okay. if you're looking at the you know looking at it, then the left side would be port, and right side would be starboard, looking at the windows. If you were inside. It, no, looking at the <laughs> spacecraft from outside. I'm okay. cleaning it out. Okay, we're gonna yes, get. I'm correct. I'm correct. If you are looking at the spacecraft from outside and you're looking at the windows, port is on the left, starboard is on the right. Okay, so this is outside the spacecraft, and we're looking at the windows, right? Did I get it right? Yep. And so this is the port side. Yep. And this is the starboard side. I'm just gonna write port because starboard is too long. Um, okay. Cross star. The Cenus bags are forward, and the heat shield is aft. Okay, so I can do FWD for forward, and this is aft, right? You got it. Okay. And then the, the line that goes from uh, the very top of the spacecraft down to the bottom between the two windows, that is the zero degree side. And then we basically talk about when we talk about uh, the different sections, then we kind of give it the um, zero to the 60, 60 to 120, you know, all the way around the spacecraft. Right. So we're talking about what, what section are we working on today or part that has to be installed. We really go from the zero to 360 numbers. Which way does it go, clockwise or counterclockwise? And is that viewing the heat shield or viewing the docking tube? <laughs> 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 um, six Left, it, port side would be like the 60 side. Go to the port first and so, then around the back and then start. So this way, like if you were to slice it like this, this would be like 60 degrees. Am I getting yeah, that right? Got it. Yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't measure sixty degrees. That's probably more like thirty degrees. Uh, it's it's three hundred sixty. Right there. Yeah, One eighty. Yeah. So yeah. ninety. Like this edge right here would be ninety, yeah. right? And so you you'd have 90. like that. Oh, you yeah, don't. We, we, we use numbers from sixty all the way around. It kind of gives you the sections: zero to sixty, sixty to one twenty. Ah, so there's no ninety, and so you skip ninety, and then the next one would be on the back side of this shot, and it would be one twenty. Yep. And then after that, three sixty. Nice. Okay. Is that because the moon is one six? Is that because the moon is one six or so <laughs> sixes all all around? No, it's because of how we assemble the spacecraft. <laughs> I <know. laughs> but but I'm still confused because then you put astronauts inside and port becomes starboard and starboard becomes port. Yeah. So if they were sitting in that spacecraft right now, <laughs> yeah, they would be oh. like, hang on, I'm gonna draw this. We got this. Oh, There's like oh, okay. I astronaut get it. head. I get it. Body yeah, goes it. down right. and then legs go forward and then like these oh, are arms yeah. like this, right? Yeah, 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 you got it. So, the, yeah, and so they're they're looking this way, and if they held up yeah. that hand, it would make an L, and if they hand up that hand, it wouldn't be an L. Okay, I get it. So yeah, if you're flying the spacecraft, you're no longer they, they'd be sitting on the space on the launch pad on their backs looking up. Right. When you're flying, no, space, I forgot. I was hand, thinking of them looking, looking at the us. window straight ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. They don't take yeah. off like this. Right, yeah, so exactly. they don't stand in there looking out the window like this. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> is that the tower? Okay, here we go. And that's ex you know, anyways. Um, See, now, they lay now, down. That we've, now that we've established that, we can talk a little bit about the propulsion system, and you can actually see the different thrusters. There are pitch, roll, yaw thrusters on the spacecraft. So the pitch up and down ones are the ones above and below the windows uh, on the zero degree side. There and there. Uh -huh. Yep, you got your pitch up and your pitch down. So if you are flying the spacecraft, those are the ones that will make the spacecraft pitch up or down. Yep. Uh, the other ones that you see there are the uh, roll thrusters, and that's if you need to roll the spacecraft around. Like that. There you go. Those are the roll thrusters. Yep. And that's like if, if you... Are out of the picture, but yaw would be like directional motion. But right. uh, keep in mind the propulsion system is only used during that video that you showed just a bit ago. After you disconnect from the service module, the spacecraft needs to turn itself around so aft end is facing down. That is when the propulsion system on the crew module is used. Uh, before that, the propulsion system on the service module is used for the roll pitch and yaw motions. I think I've got that. Let's see real quick so we can see these motions on the spacecraft. Yeah, there you go. So right now, if it had the turn, there you go. There you go. Oh, oh I see the firing. You can, you can see the firing. Right, you know something? Let's just move this this way so people can see it. There we go. Neat. And then the heat shield takes over. And then 11 parachutes is what slows you down. So let's talk about that for a second. When, it, when you hit that atmosphere, you're going over 24,000, about 24,500 miles per hour. By the time you hit the water, you're going about 30 miles per hour. And you do that entire sequence slowing yourself down from 24.5 thousand miles per hour to 20, 30 miles per hour using nothing but air. The propulsion system does not slow you down on the spacecraft. It's just the heat shield 
and the, the 11 parachutes. Uh, and after the heat shield takes over, then you have the pilots, the droves, and the mains, uh, 11 parachutes that get you all the way down. And by the way, the four bay cover, you actually can see the four bay cover is still on the image there. Uh, you have to release and jettison that forward bay cover for then the parachutes to come out. You and know, you can, if you go back to the main image, you can see the forward bay cover isn't uh, on the spacecraft. It is at the bottom of the ocean right now. Uh-huh. Fair enough. I'm Where getting it. Here? All right. So here, all right, here we go. So that is the forward bay cover still on, correct? Correct. You got Rendering it. of the forward yes. bay cover still on. And when we look at one of Jack's photos here, the forward yep. bay cover has gone away. Yep, and you can see the cannons at the top of the spacecraft there. That's where yeah. the main parachutes were uh, inside of them, and we basically launched the, the main parachutes out. Those are those. I, I remember on the webcast they had somebody that, uh, what was it? The Bigfoot team. Was it the Sasquatch team, I think? Sasquatch. <laughs> that was, like, in charge of uh, modeling where the covers would actually end up, like the footprint of debris that would come off, because the spacecraft is jettisoning things. It's getting the yeah. covers off of there, and then it's got the other, like, all those things that fell into the water, and they had a specific team to determine where those things would probably land so nobody got booped on the head, amongst yep. other important and, things. And also, it, you know, we wanted to learn, it, you know, assuming you had perfect seas and perfect conditions— how possible is it to maybe go recover some of those for future missions, even though ah. that wasn't uh, for this mission and we didn't recover them for this mission, not perfect conditions. In fact, we even picked a uh, secondary landing site. It came in uh, the the day before, I believe they decided a secondary landing site uh, for the Orion spacecraft Artemis one. Uh, but the um, future missions, perhaps we can recover the Ford Bay cover or the main parachutes. Nice. And not just wait for some divers to go discover it one day. Yeah, is, <laughs> really. That'll be a fun treasure hunt someday far in the future, right? <laughs> Barry, is this, okay, correct me if I get it wrong, but this is... Yeah, that's the Ford Bay the cover. The Ford right Bay there. cover, okay. That's the uh, Artemis 1 Ford Bay cover. The Artemis 2 Ford Bay cover is in work right now as well. And uh, Artemis 3 Ford Bay cover is coming to the Kennedy Space Center soon. Gotcha. All right, it's like I wanted to like... Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. You see it there. Okay, so the top part is the where the docking tunnel is. If you can imagine uh, being connected to uh, either the human landing system on Artemis 3 or Artemis 4 connected to the gateway, that was goes over the hole of the docking tunnel. So astronauts will be going in and out of that hole right there. Gotcha. And then those blue parts there, it's not connected to the launch abort system, uh, but that's where the launch abort system connects to the Orion spacecraft. Huh. Excellent. I'm just gonna keep bringing up pictures and let you tell us like what's in the picture. <laughs> I've got, by the way, I've got my uh, NASA. Uh, oh, yeah, what else do you have for show and tell? I've got my Orion app open on my phone right now <laughs> with a whole bunch of facts and trivia questions. Nice. And I was actually just trying to like, okay, making sure I was checking my own facts before this started <laughs> uh, about how what a temperature will Orion's heat shield be, and it's got like a trivia question on here. I'm like, okay, yeah, five thousand degrees, got that one, good. <laughs> I feel like we should turn this into stump. I got, I got a C plus on the trivia. It's great. Oh, the trivia. <laughs> Is that in the app? Like there's an app yeah, and it has yeah, a trivia? Yeah. Download, download the Orion app in the Google Play or uh, iPhone stores. And uh, there's uh, facts, factoids and uh, a trivia game in there. <laughs> nice. Great for fact checking myself. And there's some in here about the launch abort system. Uh, something like 400,000 pounds of thrust on the launch abort system and goes from uh, oh. zero to 500 miles per hour in two seconds. It's Ooh. just, you hope to never have to use that thing. The launch uh, back yeah. in July, 2019, we had a test of it where we launched in the launch abort system on a basically minute made rocket, minute made missile. And we launched off of it and it was, just, oh man, watching that thing go. It was, it was zooming. It was zooming. The main you hope to never have to use that thing. I think I got it. Here we go. This is what we're talking about. Oh, here we go. This yeah. is the, yeah, really cool. So this is the jettison motors. This isn't even like the fast motors. These are the, the slow motors. And its entire job is to pull. I hope you have it play already. It's well, playing. Because, it's playing. Okay, good. <laughs> this is inside the crew cabin. You can see uh, in the bottom right corner, our astronaut Snoopy's kind of moving around on the left side. There you go. That is the jettison oh. motor. Pulling the launch abort system away after you get in uh, up above the Earth's atmosphere before you, you know, you're not going to need the launch abort system. You're in space at that point, so you jettison it away. Oh, yeah. I love that video. It's so cool. It's crazy it's so that cool. that video exists. It is yeah. crazy that yeah. video exists. 
it's crazy that video exists before like we even opened the hatch we we saw this thing oh that is just awesome i love that video and snoopy's down there just jamming out like bongo cat or something like <laughs> <laughs> i'll play one more time there you go oh, love it. and you can see the callisto payload is active right there i hope everyone said take me you know alexa take me to the moon oh i gotta be careful oh yes <laughs> you just set up a bunch <laughs> of people's alexas yeah i just set off everybody <laughs> Uh, uh, and basically it gave at home, you could interact with learning where is the spacecraft during the entire mission. Uh, but on orbit, we actually had microphones and we had, uh, people at Johnson space center talking to over microphone to the Callista payload. And they could do things like have different things display on the panel that you're looking at there, or you could change the lights or the colors. Uh, you could pull up different, uh, temperatures of things. Check on the avionics. Check the pressures of the different fluids. Uh, really cool. The voice activated. Uh, the Callisto payload is something that we're just so excited about. Uh, future, you know, and we have it here in our homes. And a lot of times you think of uh, the space industry and how uh, technology you develop in the space industry will inspire technology that we work with here. But this is like stuff that we work with at our homes every day, now inspiring the future of space travel. So it goes both ways. Um, Barry, just, um, could you just give a short overview of Callisto just really quick, just to make that, sure. That was pretty much it. That was the, that was it. Voice activated, uh, there you go. Thank you. To the computer and the computer yeah. talk back and display yeah. information. You want, change the lights just like you do at home. It's just, it's Alexa in space. It was, it was work, um, a partnership with Lockheed Martin, uh, Amazon Alexa, uh, Cisco web, uh, web systems. Um, I think that's the name of the Cisco, but Cisco, uh, to basically create this ability for n new way of uh, having information given to the astronauts in flight and going forward into the future, you can have an entire data bank of information that the astronauts could talk to and from uh, the computer. Right. And let's say you're on Mars. This is the future state of it. Let's say you're on Mars and there's a 45 minute delay. Uh, something breaks and you have to fix it. You can like quickly ask, hey, show me the uh, procedures for fixing this thing that just broke and then it would display it, and you don't have to like have communication to and from uh houston or mission control uh yeah. to give directions uh it, it'll be a bit way for information to be displayed fast and add, give the astronauts more ability uh for quick responses and to make decisions themselves and um when about will it be able to like make the the t earl gray hot <laughs> Turn it oh out. my gosh that's a great <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to stop and think about that one for a while. What, what a doozy. <laughs> Solid reference. Um, Let's see. What other? What else have I sent to you guys? What other? Well, fun you were I speaking have? about the "Fly Me to the Moon," so I thought we should talk a little bit more about yeah, that. Yeah. So, that special um, song and video. Yeah, a couple of things to follow. Let's talk about social media. NASA has wonderful social media uh, yes. at NASA, at NASA Artemis, at NASA underscore Orion, uh, at NASA SLS, uh, Lockheed Martin as well, at LM Space. Uh, my personal Twitter is at Bonzac. So uh, if anyone follows me on Twitter, uh, you, you'll see the different, you know, I tweet silly things quite a bit. <laughs> it's all related. Um, you retweeted but, our stuff. We're okay with it. Like, yeah, very good. <laughs> love. Hey, you all, I appreciate what you all do. You help make everyone excited about what we're doing. So I appreciate you all very much. Nice. Uh, one of the things that NASA asked uh, its contractors and employees to do was create a video for Fly Me to the Moon, the you know famous Frank Sinatra song. Uh, even inside the spacecraft there, you actually saw the keynotes to ABA, whatever, Fly Me to the Moon uh, notes. So... Um, I made my one of my videos and they took it with many of the other employees of the Orion spacecraft and Artemis program and put it all together. Uh, and it's out there on NASA's YouTube channel and yeah. website. Oh, here we go. So Beautiful. I can I can show the video, but I cannot play the audio because I don't have permission to use the audio. That's yeah. that's better for me. <laughs> there you go. So I made a joke with my coworkers <laughs> because the the fun thing about this video is that they ask us to upload the raw version without any background sound at all, okay. only acapel your voice. And oh, I do sorry. not see, I am so offbeat. So when I did that, all my coworkers saw the original video and like the people just came up to me and were just like, hey Barry, fly me to the <laughs> Oh, there I am. Oh, um, wait. 
the joke was they're going to take the video and they're going to use all the parts of me where I'm not seeing. <laughs> I'm trying to pause it. There. there you go. All right. There you go. I'm just going to pause it right here for you, Barry. Tell us, Love tell it. us how you feel. Uh, yeah, it's just kiss right there. That's the baby kiss me lyric right there. But yeah, they used all the video of me where I'm not singing. So uh, I uploaded to my own YouTube channel uh, the video where you know I I'm you. Put... You know I'm on YouTube, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh man. All right. So this right here was the uh, a competition that happened right before the launch. This is a first robotics competition. Nice shoes. Uh, those, shoes. <laughs> those are yep this is what i'm known for i do, that is an orion flight suit by the way i made an orion flight suit with all the orion patches on the sleeves and uh and gagnon's uh, artemis patch on the front um and <laughs> and basically this is just me giving the raw raw go sls go orion go artemis one and the entire crowd uh into it uh you're not gonna be able to play this entire video it'll take too long <laughs> hey, it's uh, okay <laughs> We we get the we get the point right. I love the shoes. I gotta say I love the shoes. They Zoom, like... go forward a little bit. It'll, it's fun to watch the students interact. They love this stuff. They, this is at a robot competition. Oh, you here, we're tapping far. our feet. I went too far. I went too far. Okay. <laughs> Check this out. This is them. Go, uh, I got the entire crowd. Go SLS. Go Orion. Go Artemis. Uh, before <laughs> launch, and everyone's excited about this. So these are high school students nice. that are just so jazzed up about the future of the space program. And there you saw my shoes. And the next month. Oh, there's more is... of you. Wait. That's uh, basically, I did the entire video. I did the entire song. I sang the entire thing. So when I put it up on YouTube and I put the background music, it sounds a lot better than like the raw video that the raw video that all my coworkers have seen and are making fun of me for. There we go. So, Y'all, if you want to hear the, vid the the audio on this full, go to YouTube. You can find this on YouTube on Barry's channel. If you just search for Barry Bonzek on YouTube, this will come up. Uh, his name is right there on the screen. You can see how to spell his name if you don't know. Uh, I think but the phonetic spelling of my name, B-O-N-Z-A-C-K. Gotcha. Uh, then fly me to my new, fly me to my Twitter's at Bonzek B O N Z A C K. Ah. Why are we talking about this? Is so ridiculous. I'm just saying it's awesome. <laughs> you, gotta you have to have fun. You have to have fun. Have fun. I agree. NASA wanted to be able to show off the you know how <laughs> much fun we're having with this right now, and I've got to say, working on the program. <laughs> There. The attention to detail. You're at the Jupiter Inlet, and you're singing along. That's I think this is the part where you say Jupiter and Mars, and you've got that in the background. Thank you. We would get along. We do get along, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring this off the screen unless you anger me, and then I'll bring it back, Barry. Um. <laughs> oh, I just want to say we, you know, we're just having so much fun on this program right now. Uh, yeah. I've been at Lockheed Martin, like I said, since 2009, and this is the best you know the career's ever been, and it's just getting brighter and brighter and you know this launch is just a career milestone for myself as well as everyone else on the program and the future is looking bright so uh one of the other things that i do outside of being you know outside of lockheed martin uh i'm the chair of citizens for space exploration for the state of florida citizens for space exploration is a grassroots advocacy mm -hmm. we travel to washington dc every year we bring over like nearly 100 people plus like almost 30 college students to introduce college students to uh, their elected representatives. And basically, we're just an advocate for not just the Artemis program, but all NASA funding. Uh, if NASA has it in their budget, please give NASA full funding for to, for them to be able to do all their uh, programs. And the Congress really has. It has been, especially these uh, past 10 years or so, it is just so grateful uh, for bipartisan support which you know when you talk about congress that's a very weird thing to think about there there's any topics at all that congress has bipartisan support for but space exploration is something that everybody's excited for everyone is sees the value in sees that it is uh improving lives here back on earth so if you spend money you don't spend money in space you spend it on earth uh to improve life and create uh, new technologies, and it's just something that you can turn on the channel on the news. And during the time period when there's not something that's, you know, not a lot of good news on the news anymore, but when you see things like uh, anything that NASA is doing, whether it be, you know, black holes or uh, the Mars rovers or now Artemis, it, it's something that the you can turn on the TV and feel good about when you see it and just kind of have some hope that the future is bright. Well gotcha. said. Yeah. Um, do you guys go up as part of that congressional visits day, the science and technology 
an engineering one? Uh, I haven't been myself. I'm not okay. saying that no one else in the program does, but I haven't myself. Um, I know that there there are other things that uh, we have a Lockheed Martin government affairs and Lockheed Martin government relations team that is, of course, always in D.C. and uh, yeah. multiple different events that they're a part of. Yeah, no, that's just really cool because I know with our National Astronomy Society, they they select some of the astronomers to and they give you the background of how you can frame what you do in terms that the representatives and stuff of value. And then they teach you how the budget comes together and how to represent what you do to your congressman or to your senator. And it's really cool. Thing that is do. really cool. That yeah. is wonderful. I mean, when you think about NASA, it's easy to talk about the benefits NASA has to any senator, no matter uh, who it is that they, yeah. if you're talking to somebody in like Houston or Florida, it, it's pretty obvious. Okay. We have the Kennedy Space Center right. and you know, we have the Johnson Space Center. They're, it's a very short discussion because they're already on board. And at that point, it's just going there and updating. Here's the latest news. Would you like to see the latest pictures? Uh, we already know that you support us. Would you like to just see what we're doing now? As opposed to one of the things that they, uh, groups that I'm a part of, I go to uh, like Wisconsin and Idaho and uh, these states that don't have NASA centers right. and we bring college students with us and uh, basically explain when you talk to uh, a staffer, maybe I'm not talking to the member him or herself, but I'm talking to a staff person. Uh, that person's younger than me, usually in their mid twenties. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, they frequently uh, are there for uh, a few years and then maybe move to another staff or move to another position or get their experience and you know go on yeah. um, to other parts of their career. But the turnover is pretty sudden. So a, a staffer has a wide portfolio of things that they have to be concerned about many different types of science groups so it's not just space exploration this person's focused on clearly because there's if you had somebody like that focus you would need a staff of just hundreds of people and there's not that many of them so one of the things that we do is we go and we uh give them like the base have you heard about the artemis program all right let's walk you through this is what nasa does did you know that nasa isn't just space they're also aeronautics that's the second a in nasa national aeronautics and space administration then you can talk a little bit about you know nasa's work in creating a plane that doesn't have sonic booms and uh earth sciences okay you're from um uh from wisconsin okay maybe uh you're not receiving um funding for launching a rocket at your in your state but are you aware of the earth sciences that tell you about the irrigation and weather patterns and of uh, many many things uh that does infect agriculture in your state agriculture is huge with the space program yep so anyone uh any one of the members can find something in nasa's portfolio that very much benefits uh the people that they represent that's so true um so i know that uh obviously we can talk forever uh, but we wanted to ch give a chance to any of the people watching out there if they had any questions. Das, you got a cue going? I've got lots of questions. Um, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> We've been own. going fast and furious the entire time here. Uh, chat has had, had the opportunity to put in tons of great questions, and I want to make sure we get some of those in. But I want to start with this. Barry, and I turned on my camera for it. Uh, Westy the Third, one of the viewers in chat, said, "Guys like Barry are so important for the next generation of nerds. What a legend!" <laughs> Absolutely, positively correct. There, I had to make sure that I read that specific out loud. You have no fear. You're putting yourself out there. You're helping connect with people of all different ages. You're interesting. You're like giving us this information. Clearly, you know your stuff. Even if you review the app beforehand, that's fine. I'll allow it. Um, <laughs> you you know what you're talking about, but you're just so passionate about what you're telling us. This is absolutely fantastic. So from everybody watching, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Oh, man. I just can't thank you all enough just for hosting this. And you know, helping me share the excitement about this program in the future and where we're going and the fact that we're not done yet. This was just yep. a more test flight. And, you know, we, but you kind of saw before the flight, you know, everyone reminding, hey, remember, this is just a test flight. And now we're just going 100% success. It's all fantastic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just, I could, I can picture, I can picture you at the, the wing stop or sports bar or whatever it is going like touchdown. And they're like, what? Who's playing? And it's like, no, it's Orion. <laughs> <laughs> There's video video on my Twitter of yeah everyone going oh. cheering in the background. Jeez. Oh, wait, they're parachutes. <laughs> <laughs> the parachutes? It's but like yes, what? 
<laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so you, thank you all for helping us share this excitement and it, you know your webcast, all the space museums, anything that gets people excited, and including you know that's why I try to be sure to go volunteer STEM education, first robotics yeah. competition. I'm the yeah. master of ceremonies. I'm the play-by-play -play announcer at the event. So if you were to come to the World Championship at the George R. Brown Center in Houston in April, yep. I'm one of the guys on the microphone. Nice. So and I'm on uh, Franklin Field. All the fields are named after different scientists. Yep. So that's one of the things that nice. first wanted is that you have sports fields that are named after, you know, sports figures. They wanted their fields named yeah. after scientists. Science so you have figures. Galileo nice. Field, Newton Field. I, I'm Franklin Field. I dress up as Benjamin Franklin for the of day. Of course you do. I have Benjamin <laughs> Franklin play by playing for you as your robots on the field. <laughs> I thought you were talking about Rosalind Franklin. We, the, the, we have Madame Curie is one of them, but th this was specifically Benjamin Franklin. It's electricity theme uh, on my field. <laughs> okay, I'll allow. Oh, geez. Well, let me let me do this. I have an entire queue of questions. There's absolutely no way we're going to get through all these questions, but I'm going to see <laughs> how many I can uh, can get through here. Some more technical, some more general, but let's, let's go through some. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is where I give the caveat, reminding everybody that I don't work for NASA. I don't work for Boeing. Yep. I'm not on the SLS rocket. <laughs> Uh, I'm an MBA. I'm not an engineer. I'm That's okay. Manager, I make schedule. So, okay. Now that we've prefaced that, hit me with it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> during the Apollo days, the capsule would traveling travel at nearly 25,000 miles per hour. I saw the Orion capsule traveling at 5,000 miles per hour. I think there's a significant disconnect there, and it may be related to the live telemetry showing like how fast it's currently going. So, for people that were sort of confused about Orion and the speed of it when they saw that telemetry, how Orion goes yeah. lots of different speeds, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a it's a really great question because I had that same question too, because I didn't know, you know, at different points of the mission how fast the spacecraft is going. And also you got to keep in mind uh speed is relative to the location where you're measuring it from. So the one of the questions that like us employees had is we see this thing popping up now. Is that uh relative to Earth or is that relative to moon? Right. Or you know what what is that five thousand five thousand miles per hour compared to what? Um and I, we we're told it is Earth. Um, so yeah, the, it does go different speeds on right. different points of the mission. Um, it, otherwise you just zoom right past the moon, right? <laughs> but when it re-entered, it was go, it wasn't poking along when it re-entered. It came in hot. Oh yeah. It, it was going 24,500 miles per hour as soon as it hit the, uh, heat shield hit the atmosphere. Yep. Great, Cause... great question. Uh, oh, and by the way, some of the milestones we got to talk about. Sure. Since we're here anyway. We're talking about speeds. You got to talk about distance. We got as low as I think 80 miles off the surface of the moon and as far as 40,000 miles away from the moon on the opposite side of Earth. Mm -hmm. So the moon is about over uh, 239,000, yeah, 239,000 miles away. And we went 40,000 miles beyond Past that. that. So this is a crew rated spacecraft that people can sit inside furthest from Earth any spacecraft created for crew has ever gone. Right. Uh, the last milestone was Apollo 13 because they had to do this emergency slingshot motion around the moon in order to return because they had an explosion on their service module. So they had to abort the landing and they were just had to get home. So they made this off nominal trajectory around the moon for a free return. Um, so that was the, the, uh, previous the time yeah pre previous record and that one still has people on it so we got to go break that one and we will artemis 2 will break that record uh with people on it right yeah, that's that, that was that was one of the things like i i'll talk about it on social media it was like oh the first the spacecraft been and the people are like well actually the ascent module left lunar orbit and da, 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 da. well the ascent module was not rated to have people in it in that situation like yeah that's not a thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can, you can say actually as long as you want, but you yeah. know, the big actually there is Apollo 13 had people on it. We're going to break it with Apollo 2. Right. There you go. <laughs> That's sorry. That's... Artemis 2. But Apollo 13 had people. We're going to break that record with Artemis with 2. With Artemis 2. There's more discussion. <laughs> right. Um, speaking of that, are you already, is your team already working on Artemis 2 heat shields production, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, yeah. We are very far along with Artemis 2. We are well over halfway done with the spacecraft. Right. Uh, and the heat shield is nearing complete. The Ford Bay cover is nearing complete. Uh, it'll be installed. Both will be installed this year. Uh, you were showing some really cool pictures just a bit ago of the direct field acoustics testing. Ah, uh, yes. Um, and that's coming up this year as well. And that is actually, oh, man, I could go. We have the option. Do we want to talk about direct field acoustics testing or go <laughs> answer some more questions? Because I could go on about <laughs> hey, that for a while. Hey, well, tell us about <laughs> this real quick. This is the direct field acoustics testing picture, right? Yeah, yeah, I love this picture. So this is like after, right 
right between uh, everything's installed. In fact, the back shells there are temporary installed. We got to take them off after this test. Um, but this is like all parts are on the spacecraft, and we have a subcontractor come in and stack up speakers. Now, how many speakers are around this thing? It's Those are like speakers. Stories of speakers <laughs> surrounding the spacecraft. So, if you can imagine uh, going to a concert. If you took every single speaker away from that concert and stacked them up and then multiplied that by two, that's what you're looking at there. Whoa. So we are blasting sound. This is the direct field acoustic testing, blasting sound. And we do this for both the crew module and the service module. And we're testing to make sure that uh, it's able to withstand the acoustics loads that it will see on launch day. Right. So literally they just turn up the speakers. What do they play? Like rock music? Like We've had a lot of discussions on what we should play. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably just Watching a the moon, frequency. Yeah, there you go. Very, very, we've still definitely decided it needs to be heavy metal of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to try to sing heavy metal lyrics here on the show. So um, so this is coming up for Artemis 2, or the, the Orion capsule to be used in Artemis 2, correct? Yeah. What, what you're looking at there is Artemis 1. Right. Uh, Artemis 2 is reaching this milestone soon. Gotcha. The, this year. Reaching this milestone this year. Uh, I'll try to stay off of committing to dates right now for the program. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and this where, year. Where, oh, I was just going to say, where is that testing taking place? The acoustics. Yeah, that's all at the Kennedy Space Center. All the parts yeah. for the spacecraft is at the Kennedy Space Center. The service module, the crew module are both yeah. there. They've both gone through um, initial power on functional testing, uh, getting closer and closer to completion of uh, both service module and crew module to where we will st stick them into what we call the fast cell Um Final assembly, something testing, uh, cell of the Neil Armstrong Operation Checkout Building at the Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, uh, made it together, uh, and then do some more testing to it in integration uh, before we send it out the door and give to NASA. Nice. You know that acronym right. works, right? Fast F A S T. You said something. Something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Something <laughs> testing. It could be S T, like something <laughs> testing. <laughs> <laughs> Final assembly, something testing. Like, yeah, that spells yeah, fast. fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. I'm going to grab some more questions. I mean, I have a whole stack of questions here. Uh, building. Oh, sorry. So there's a couple different parts of this, right? And maybe you can give us a little insight. Like, what is the hardest part of the heat shield? Is it actually producing the tiles? Is it applying the tiles? Is it testing something? Like, like what is the longest part of that process? We're doing the electrical work right now on the uh, heat shield. So after you complete the bonding portion of it, and by the way, the heat shield's made in multiple different places. So okay, the, uh, started all the way back at our Lockheed Martin facility in Denver. You have a uh, skeleton inside of it that's made like of titanium, right? Uh, because things that's uh, lightweight but also extremely hard, and it's taking the brunt of the force of reentering, right? Um, and then you have a composite over it. And then you bond the blocks on top of that. Um, and then you flip it over. Mm -hmm. um, and you actually, before all before you do all the blocks, you actually have to match drill the back shells to the heat shield. Uh, but then after the words, you bring it over to uh, install all the electrical components to it. And there's a uh, antenna inside of the heat shield that matches to the antenna inside the service module. Okay. So one of the things that I'm like very much hoping is that if that antenna worked, you'll be able to get video from the service module after the Orion spacecraft has disconnected from it, assuming the two gigahertz, uh, the, the two antennas are talking to each other. Okay. So okay. it's one of the things that it's recorded inside the crew cabin right now, and we're not going to know until we're able to go, you know, get that data from the spacecraft. All right. Sure. Um, but yeah, there's, what is the most difficult part? That's a, it's, we, we feel pretty confident in building our heat shields now. We've built enough of them that I would not consider the heat shield one of the most difficult parts about the spacecraft at this point. Okay. Like you understand the materials, you understand how to bond it and make sure like, I don't know, when you do a static fire, they don't all fall off or whatever. Um, like yeah. you have that experience with the material, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, it, I would not consider the heat shield the riskiest part of the spacecraft. Let's just put it that way. Gotcha. Okay. All <laughs> we, right. We also heat, the the heat shield by itself. You actually showed one of the pictures of it next to a giant oven. You probably didn't realize what the picture was when you displayed it there, but there's a giant oven slash freezer inside of the Neil Armstrong Operation Checkout Building, and we stick the crew module, service module, uh, and heat shield separately inside of the that thermal chamber, so we can do some testing uh, to each one individually to make sure that they can you know take the uh, freezing temperatures as well as uh, 
oven oven level temperatures. You can bake some a is, whole lot of cookies inside that chamber. Is it that one? <laughs> Did that's, I guess correctly? One. That's an oven. Yes. That is an oven slash freezer. No yeah. kidding. I wish yeah. I had an oven slash freezer. Yeah, right. What a <laughs> <laughs> so that that's part of I mean what are they tested in there they bake it together yeah. in there what's the oven slash freezer yeah. for yeah test, thermal testing thermal testing yeah that is near completion before we put the the paint and tape on the heat shield all the Avco blocks are already installed and uh, next we're going to uh, basically do this freezing slash heating thermal cycle testing uh, on the heat shield and we do the same thing like I said to the crew module and service module and then you just make sure that you know, nothing went wrong with the test. Do you know is... how hot and how cold the... Yeah, I don't think I'm going to say that out loud, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I just go, I know I'm allowed to talk to this because that is a public release picture. Okay. Yeah. How much yeah. I'm testing things, I just go, you know what, I got to... Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Unless I have read specifically what those are in an article. There you go. Right, right. It's All like, right. do you know how hot and cold it can go? And you're just like, yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Um, uh, Das, can I ask one more yeah, follow up? Of course. Um, for the one that just flew, besides just like what I would imagine is just giving it the once over and really trying to see how all the thermal stuff performed, are there like specific tests or analysis things that you do also after the spacecraft has flown? After it's flown? Yes. Yeah. And yes, there. <laughs> so that's one of the things. Um, that we can kind of talk about a little bit. What's next for the Artemis One crew module? Yeah. Sure, that's a question yeah. actually in here. Like, what are you what are you going to do with it now? I should have let you ask the question. Then I, I was getting there. <laughs> Summer <laughs> asked it. Go, yeah. Sure. So, what is next? So, if you want to see an Orion spacecraft on display, like I said, go to the visitor complex gateway exhibit. Orion Exploration Flight Test One is on display uh, that you can go see, and it is a flown one thousand miles away. So, uh, a lot of questions that. I've seen pop up recently is when is Artemis One going to be in display and uh, what museum is it going to be in and where where is it going to go now? It's busy. Answer, <laughs> what's that? It's busy right now. Give it some time. <laughs> it's a little it's a little busy at the moment. We we're still getting data off this thing. We haven't um, uh, um, as far as I know the hatch hasn't opened up yet. I don't know. I haven't checked the news since I sure. think the weekend off. Um, but there's data inside the spacecraft that we're going to go, of course, pull off. And there's parts inside the spacecraft that are going to fly on Artemis too, mainly being some of the avionics components, uh, the GPS receivers, um, uh, the Orion initial measurement unit, um, the seat that Commander uh, Campos, the Munikin, right. is sending right now. We're going to pull that seat off. It's going to fly on Artemis too. Okay. Uh, so there's multiple components inside the spacecraft that – uh, are going to be pulled out and reused. And then the next question is, okay, in the future, Artemis 2 is going to become uh, reused, and then Artemis 3 is going to be reused. Artemis 3 is going to eventually be like Artemis 6, the same crew module. So we're going to get into a cycle where we're going to the, uh, the spacecraft will land, will be refurbished, and then fly again. So this is our first opportunity to take an, a spacecraft and really start testing some of those things. Because Exploration Flight Test 1, that wasn't really in the mix yet. There weren't any contracts out there right. saying that we're going to fly. There's no – and the design changed so much from uh, EFT-1 to Artemis-1. You wouldn't really refly uh, EFT-1. Right. And, and so uh, this is really a great opportunity for our, uh, Lockheed Martin to go and learn about uh, reuse from different parts of the spacecraft. Uh, and it's even going to become part of a test campaign uh, called Environmental Test Article, where it's going to go to Plumbrook, Ohio, right. and we're going to be doing more testing to it. So things that we didn't do on Artemis 1 that we'll be doing on Artemis uh, 2 and 3, for example, we're going to have a docking module. The docking module will connect the Iran spacecraft to the human landing system, and then the docking module will connect to the uh, the uh, outpost, the gateway out there around the moon. Yep. Uh, that will be part of the future spacecraft so we have to test it, including things like that is going to have to be ejected. Uh, same thing like the Ford Bay cover. We had many, many tests on this spacecraft. In order to fly one of these spacecrafts, you do a lot of ground testing. Yep. Every single pyro campaign and pyros uh, mm -hmm. jettison things get tested here on Earth. And I think I've sent some videos. Uh, we call it testing Orion's twin. We actually made a full production Orion spacecraft, not built to fly, but built to be torture tested. Uh, and we had... We blasted sound at the thing. We connected hydraulics and pulled on it. We shook it. We uh, blasted every single pyro off of it. Uh, and that basically qualified Artemis 1 and 2 missions. 
but we still have more testing to do for the parts that weren't developed yet, like the docking module. So that's going to be part of the environmental test campaign. And the idea for this Artemis 1 crew module is we want to be able to use it as many different times in many different ways and figure out more uses to use for it as opposed to sticking it in a museum. So right. it, eventually, will it end up in a museum? Yes. The da that day is not coming anytime soon. It's got a lot of life left in it. Yeah, it just went around the moon and it's busy. Like, we didn't send it around the moon for fun or just to take some pictures and be like, yay, we went back to the moon. Like, we sent it around the moon and we're going to study it. I imagine, like, a heat shield expert, like, on the bottom of the heat shield with a little geologist hammer. <laughs> <laughs> like, like testing the, like, okay, what's the flakosity of this or whatever? Like, I don't know what the actual terms are for heat shields, yeah, but. Uh, I've yeah. heard that there's like a, a tarp under it. So when we move it around, we're, you know, it, it's yeah, well, on the bottom and parts yep. are falling off. And like, we're not just like laying it, like laying on the ground or something. We're actually recovering those parts. You recover the parts are... that fall off. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see here. Um, so that, I think that's a really important distinction to make. It's an artifact, like would go in a museum, but it's an artifact, like an experimental artifact that you're going to get a lot of information from by studying it, right? Yeah. Artemis 1 was a test mission. It is going yep. to continue its life as a test article. Yep. It's a test article, exactly. Yeah. Makes sense. Let's see here. I've got lots more questions. Um, do we know, just a quick one off the top of our head, how hot was the heat shield when it touched the water? Is it one of those things, like we've all seen the video where they heat up a, I don't know, a shuttle tile or something, and then they hold it, and it's glowing red, but then the tile's actually not hot? Like, is the heat shield hot itself, or does the heat shield stop from getting hot? It, 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 it's quite warm. It is it is quite warm. It's had a little bit of time to cool off because, you know, it uses the heat shield portion at the top and uh, of the atmosphere. Right. And then the parachutes deploy, the heat shield's no longer active. Now the parachutes have taken over. So it's had some time, but there's a really cool picture that at Elm Space uh, tweeted uh, showing like smoke coming off of the heat shield. And their like tweet was smoking. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is quite toasty. Awesome. Uh, what is the exact temperature when it hits the water? I'm not really sure, but I, I bet it's creating some steam. Yeah, you know something? I see surf's up, y'all we did it, gotcha. There's a lot of one-word tweets in here. Single drop in the ocean. I'm looking for the smoking one. <laughs> they have a lot of, that one just says earth. We're not over it. I don't see the smoking one. I will continue to try and look for that. Chad, yeah. if somebody finds that, like, let me know that you found the smoking tweet. But that was a question. Was the heat shield still hot enough when it dipped in the water that it would, psh, you know, like, like send off a bunch of steam? And it sounds like that's true. I think the majority of what you see is the spray from the impact, the 30 miles per hour, you know, giant, you know, 1,000 pounds something hitting the water. You see a bunch of spray. So I'm not sure you see the steam. <sighs> but, yeah, it is. It's warm. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hey, we've got uh, Michael Baylor here today helping me with the stream, and he has found this. This is the smoking tweet right there here. There you go. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Awesome. So even before it hits the water, um, it's sort of smoking. The entire spacecraft looks like it's smoking there. So thanks, yeah. Michael. He found that tweet and linked it to me real quick. Love it. Great picture. All right. Excellent. Um, let's see here. Oh, somebody was asking. We were talking about the flotation bags. I'm, like, doing a random lightning round of questions now. Uh, sure. We were talking about the flotation bags, and it had different stability modes. Do the flotation bags open or, I guess, inflate no matter what? Or do they only inflate if it's in certain orientations? Is there an order that they inflate in? Um, they inflate no matter what. Okay. There are four that inflate immediately. And there's one that's a delayed uh, infl inflation. Okay. God, does that, like, make it, if it's on its side or unstable or something like that, like, four inflate and then the last one pops it over or something, maybe? I don't know. You know what? I don't know. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> the, answer is, the answer is probably yes. Uh, mm -hmm. They've done tons and tons and tons of testing uh, at Houston Johnson Space Center and the Buoyancy Lab. Uh, they, they've tested every single angle of that thing. Um, and the Oceaneering Group has done a lot of studies on the, like, perfect amount of inflation and delay and yep yeah, there's but that yes they inflate no matter what four of them inflate first and the last one's a delay inflation gotcha makes sense um another lightning round question we were talking about all the the sides we talked about port and starboard and fore and aft and that sort of stuff stuff uh do you ever use dorsal or ventral <laughs> <laughs> Great question. No. Next really? question. No. 
<laughs> Shucks. Because, okay, this is this is somebody I think that knows me and my Kerbal stuff because I would always explain, like if you have a spacecraft, right? This is like the little capsule and then you have the service module behind it and the rest of the rocket. I would always explain it like a shark and there's like yeah. a shark with like teeth and stuff and then the dorsal side, the upside of the spacecraft was like the dorsal fin on the shark. So I would say you have to understand which way is up on your spacecraft and I would use the dorsal fin of the shark to explain which way was up on the spacecraft. But apparently... They don't need that when they're real astronauts. That's okay. Everybody knows what a shark looks like. Fascinating. Dorsal <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna start implementing that. I'm just gonna add it in the charts and yeah. like, make it sound like it's a real thing. Like it's right? a real thing. Because yeah. you know the way a shark sort of swims and you're looking at your spacecraft and Kerbal Space Program like, oh, which way is up and down? And I, I hit the W key, but it went up. What happened? It's because you didn't know which way was up on your spacecraft. Everybody always like, oh, there's no such thing as up in space. There is up in space relative to your spacecraft because you need to go pitch up versus pitch down versus yaw versus whatever. Rant over. I'm done. Um. That being said, the space shuttle, for instance, orbited upside down and backwards. Right. Backwards. <laughs> so you can orient in any way, but you need to know on the space <laughs> shuttle itself that the windows are on the top. You don't enter windows the first. Windows are on the top, but they face the ground. Sometimes, but not when they come down. And not when it lands, for sure. Sure. Okay. sure. Authority of orbit. <laughs> it flies backwards, so all the micrometeorite debris... Uh, hits the engines and not the windows. The engines and not the windows. Nice. It's important. Like it all depends. Like any good scientific answer, it depends, right? It depends. Um, zenith and Nadir. Nadir. Is there uh, any concept of zenith and Nadir like on the space station? There's a whole discussion about this apparently. Man, I I miss a lot of the. Not that I am aware of. Okay. <laughs> You're going to have to explain that one to me. What is what is Zenith and Nadir? Uh, Zenith and Nadir are the directions that they use to orient themselves on the space station. So there's oh, okay. the uh, Zenith side that points up towards the sky, and there's the Nadir side where the ISS, the, the cupola, normally points down towards the Earth. And the ISS, with gravity and blah, 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 gradients and stuff, and thrusters and CMGs, keeps itself in that orientation where Zenith is always up and Nadir is always down, unless where spacecraft starts to fire a thruster and flips it around. Um, okay. Anyways. Yeah. It's also, it's directly overhead. Like There you go. The spot directly overhead is the zenith, and then the nadir is the opposite. Oh, did I say it wrong? Is that in astronomy as Is well. it nadir? It's not nadir? I think it's nadir. Okay. I will take Summer's word <laughs> for that. I something today. I know. I Great. <laughs> Maybe chat's <laughs> correcting me as well. They're like, what? He doesn't even know how to say it. Um, all right. Let's see here. Uh, can we link your socials? We've done that before, but Lionel in chat was saying they'd love to follow Barry, and they want to make sure they can know where to find Barry. So on Twitter, Barry, we had linked those up, didn't we? I've got Bonzac, B O N Z A C K. In phonetically spelled B O N Z A C K. There's the link. Marito, one of our mods, is putting those links in chat. And if you follow that link, Barry, you tweet out other things from that Twitter. Is that like a clearinghouse for stuff you do? Is that a good spot to follow you? Yeah, yeah, I, I talk about robots, space, and UCF football. Gotcha. <laughs> robots, space, <laughs> and UCF. National Champions 2017, Space U. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, make sure you toss Barry a follow on there. That was an actual question. It's not like a made-up thing so that we can just talk about your socials real quick. Um, ah, somebody talking about the skip maneuver. How much do you know about the skip maneuver where it sort of skipped off the atmosphere and came back in? Yeah, and you know what's funny is that that was kind of a surprise to me after you know spending the whole time building the spacecraft, right? Uh, learning about that, and I had to go and learn about what does that even mean. So yeah, it's kind of like you skip a, a rock off of a pond. Right. They did the same thing with the Orion spacecraft. First time that uh, a human-rated spacecraft has done this on Earth's atmosphere, and this is a maneuver that Lockheed Martin's well aware of for uh, the Martian atmosphere. We build the uh, the aero shells uh, for all of the basically anything that's ever landed on Mars. Uh, Lockheed Martin has built the aero shells for it, and we've flown like more missions to Mars than I can even count at this point. So um, this is a skip reentry maneuver. It hits the atmosphere at that twenty four thousand five hundred miles per hour. It skips off the atmosphere and then comes back down. And but when it comes back down, it, it reenters at about sixteen point eight thousand miles per hour. So uh, it, it gives you that nice little slowdown. Uh, without actually burning up part of the heat shield. And it also gives you uh, a much higher accuracy of deciding where you want to land. Okay. So 
yeah so okay. super cool we've never done this before and sure. yeah you know, it's kind of one of the things that like whenever you say we're going to do something we've never done before it kind of gives you that little bit of well that's exciting uh <laughs> it, that sounds risky okay nice. <laughs> we're gonna do that on this first mission okay then great let's but, do it yeah, that's a really great thing to do it on an uncrewed spacecraft, I suppose. Uh, worked perfectly. I mean, how cool is that to think that we can bounce a spacecraft off the atmosphere? How cool. Just right, even. Because if you like watch Apollo 13, the movie or whatever, they're like, if we're too shallow, it'll like skip off and go off to the sun. And if we're too deep, it'll burn up. And like you have to do it just right, like, I don't know, the three bears or whatever. Um, to <laughs> There's like a porridge <laughs> joke in there somewhere, but whatever. Um, Goldilocks. Yep. <laughs> Goldilocks, yeah. Um, they have to skip just the right amount so that you still end up re-entering. You lose enough energy that you come back down again, but you're not so, they're not so, I guess, aggressive that you don't actually skip and you get too hot i guess right um so the heat shield the heat shield i guess was designed for that specifically like did they have to make the heat shield thicker or thinner or is it like a different way to support that maneuver it was designed for that that wasn't like something they just made up on the way back from the moon right yeah absolutely right right, right. uh no it's part of the requirements of the heat shield gotcha part of the requirements of the heat shield all right um, let's see I'm, there's just so many questions i'm trying to mix it up the different types of topics and stuff like that uh, we had talked about the processing. We know that it's back, and we know that the Portland got Orion from Artemis One, and that is going to be, is that going to, like, end up at your office, end up at the Cape? What's yep. the plan yep. for that? Coming back to the Kennedy Space Center. Coming back to the Kennedy Space Center. Okay. And uh, from that, they'll be, like we already talked about, you're even gathering up pieces of the heat shield that flake off as it moves around and things like that. Like, everything, every piece of that spacecraft is important for science and engineering the next one, correct? Absolutely. And then when it uh, re returns back here, it'll go to the uh, multi-payload processing facility at the Kennedy Space Center. And like I mentioned before, that is where we'll be able to take parts out of it uh, to then reinstall into Artemis II. And then it can go, uh, other parts will go fly, go to other places, other space centers, uh, and do some testing to individual parts before you send the entire spacecraft to become the environmental test article. Gotcha. Uh, and there, there's also going to have to be some deservicing to it, of course. Right now, it still has hydrazine inside of the spacecraft. Right. Uh, super nasty stuff. So if anyone's driving around on the road, uh, please don't wreck into my spacecraft. It'll be a bad day for everybody involved. <laughs> please don't wreck into my <laughs> spacecraft. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so still, like we've talked about that again, but I, there was a specific question. Y'all have a lot to learn from it. Let's put it that That's way. Right. Um, here is a follow-up question to that. Is the design for Artemis II locked in? Like you're not going to change the shape of tiles or anything like that. You're already making the second heat shield, correct? Yeah, it's already near done. What's... Already near complete. And we're already working on Artemis three at the Kennedy Space Center. Artemis four is at the Michoud Assembly Facility right now, being welded together. It's going to arrive at the Kennedy Space Center um, in this year. And Artemis five, uh, Amro tweeted, you know, the, one of the sections of Artemis five. It is a real spacecraft, partially already. Wow. Uh, yeah, metal's already being cut on Artemis five. Wow. Uh, to be sent to the Michoud Assembly Facility. So. Yeah, rocking and rolling, man. All right, good deal. Um, so let's see here. I'm just continuing on with this. We and again, don't crash into the spacecraft if you see it driving around. Um, <laughs> so no big. Okay, there we go. There was the question I was I was trying to get to. Um, you've already almost finished the second heat shield in the spacecraft. The first heat shield came back. The spacecraft came back fine. Like, it's been recovered. It didn't burn up in the yeah. atmosphere or anything like that. It seems unlikely, and you don't have to answer this question. I will answer it, that there'll be any massive changes required for the heat shield because we already got the spacecraft Greg. Jack was standing right next to it, right? Yeah, and at this point, uh, the Orion spacecraft is under um, what they call the OPOC contract, Orion Production and Operations contract. Okay. Uh, the design is becoming more and more set every day and less engineering changes. Artemis 3 is going to be Artemis 4 is going to be Artemis 5. It gotcha. is a you build the spacecraft and then you build that spacecraft again type spacecraft. Mm -hmm. uh, we're no longer a developmental program uh, at this point. So we the design is becoming more and more set with the uh, exception of like some new things that like, you take some stuff uh, that we know, but then you add stuff to it to make it more reusable or make sure that water doesn't penetrate it or uh but it's the same same design and maybe some small modifications gotcha uh, there's some things like the the docking module is going to be new that didn't fly on artemis one 
Makes sense. That's I, I think that's a like so many of us are so used to. Oh yeah, they're gonna do one thing, then change everything, right? We have a lot of Starship and SpaceX fans out there, and Orion is a different animal. Like you understand the materials, you've done this test, it looks like everything came back good, and you're in production mode. You're not creating things out of the blue anymore, like making up how it should work. You know how it needs to work, and it's time to produce more of these so that we can fly again. Did I sort of summarize that correctly? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're building multiple spacecraft at yep. the same time in parallel right now. Uh, so we're deprocessing Artemis 1 at the same time we're building uh, Artemis 2 and 3 in the sa all at the Kennedy Space Center, and Artemis 4 is arriving soon. So we'll have four crew modules all in work at the same time. Gotcha. Is that the official terminology, deprocessing? I don't know if there's an official term. <laughs> okay, but that's what like you would use it if, if you were making. I don't want to say a... yes to anything word official. <laughs> you would use it in a PowerPoint. Like you would be like, okay, and deprocessing now. Like you would put that PowerPoint up on the screen. <laughs> uh, He's not going to commit to this. All right, I won't. I won't pin you down uh, on no, that. I'm not going to commit to a, a specific <laughs> phrase here. <laughs> um, we get a ton of like grief in the YouTube comments when we say destack, and everybody's like, oh, there's no such thing as destacking, and then we point them to the NASA documents that say destack in them, and are like, we use the actual terminology NASA uses. So you said deprocessing. That's why That's why I asked that. Um, I want to do it. There is a word. There, there might be. I'm not on the reuse team, but there might I, be a real word. For I'm going to go with deprocessing. I like it. It's not reprocessing. It wasn't processed <laughs> in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I want to do a thing. And I, I hope that this is cool. We've got all, we're actually running out of time here. We've got all of these pictures that Jack took, those members program pictures that not everybody has seen. You probably saw some of them on the stream. But there were so many things in here that I don't know what they are. And Barry, you know what they are? <laughs> before uh, uh, maybe you do maybe. know you were like oh yeah that's this window and it's got this coating on the outside and this on the inside um can i just ask you what a couple things are that i see in these pictures from jack if i can sure you could just say not sure that's a, that's an excellent I, it, thing to it say it is okay not to know things yes the that is, so true. Program is made up of thousands and thousands of thousands of people that are very good at their one little part of the space craft. right but not everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just gonna hop over here this way and start with this one. Um, this you talked about the windows in the thrusters. And what were the little silver things again? Yeah, that was for the electric stack discharge. It goes over the the silver tape. Gotcha. So that that like connects different things together, or it makes it one no, big. They're not, they're not connected. It's basically. Um... I, I'm pretty sure they're not connected together. I'm gonna. I this is one of the things that I actually was asking questions this okay. week about. Uh, not something that I work on, uh, but yeah, very. You, you want to be able to know things that like you can see it from the outside of a display of a museum. So that's like I need to go learn a bit more about this myself. But from what I am told, that is, let's say there's a static type electrical event in space, right? It'll help direct it away from the spacecraft. Gotcha. Okay. How exactly does that work? Uh, ask a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> but these, uh, like these parts here, the gold foil is different than the silver foil. Is that actually gold foil? Um, no, it's this same. I showed the tile here. Go called Syax tape. Here we this go. Stuff. Ah, it's, it's burnt up. This stuff. Gotcha. Okay. So in some places, that's like peeled off a little bit, but that's normal for the spacecraft. I guess like you don't see all the the letters and stuff like that, right? Um, the letters are on, are the stamping on the black tiles themselves and the silver tape goes over it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, are these speakers? <laughs> <laughs> They're not speakers. Clearly those, those are, those must be some sort of vents or something like that, right? I will go find out. That's oh, a don't, good Okay. Question. Don't worry about it. Let's go to some yeah. bigger things. It's also things like, yeah. Wait, umbilical go back. <laughs> oh, wait, go back. Well, I just thought the whole picture, if you zoom back out, it really looks like uh, a robot or a transformer face. Oh, it does. Yeah, I think it looks like Batman mask. A Batman yeah, mask, too. nice. <laughs> <laughs> we call that panel F. Panel F. Actual panel F. Gotcha. F Batman. And this is like this is some sort of pass through into the things. Did y'all have anything to do with this, or you have to like make a seal around it, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that is the umbilical. So that is where the I'm, I'm pretty sure of it that this is the umbilical that connects to the service module. So uh, multiple things pass through here. The avionics boxes are located inside the crew cabin. Uh, so if you push a button on the in the crew module that like say fire a thruster on the service module, uh, electrical passer goes through the avionics boxes inside yep. the crew module outside through the uh, crew module down into the 
umbilical down into the service module. So the electrical pass-throughs go from avionics out, uh, but then fluids go from service module in. So the oxygen, the water, uh, any of the fluids that go uh. into the crew cabin go up through the umbilical and through the pass-through and uh, to the to the astronauts. Gotcha. Are these are these tiles here the same as the other tiles? Like, is this part of the back shell? He's like, what do you term the tiles that are around this? That's a good question. I am not sure what that is made of. I do. Okay. That's... I, there, there, might, there might be TPS tiles. Those are called, you know, thermal protection. Thermal protection, there might yeah. Be tiles on that as well. Good question. I, I believe the answer is yes just by looking at it, but I'll, I'll go, I need to go look. Gotcha, gotcha. And then I got one more that I was looking for. Let's see here. You said there were two parts to the windows, right? Or it's like a whole sandwich of windows. There's like an yeah. exterior part. And like, how many layers are there in the window? Oh, that's a good question. I I know that there's a pressure pane and I know there's a thermal protection system pane. Gotcha. How many more panes in addition to that between those inner and outer ones? That's a good question. Um, and I, you know, what's funny is I know I've looked at that multiple times and helped, you know, with the process of installing them. Um, but that's that's the main thing to know that inside there's a pressure window, outside there's a thermal protection system window. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And seals and things in between both, so that way any one could crack and you'll still have a pressure seal. Makes sense. There were there were a ton of specific questions in chat about oh this specific part that specific part. So I tried to generalize them. Y'all, if I got one of your questions, I tried to sort of like ask more general questions. Um, but the specific questions about oh what's the exact gravity of this and that and the other that's not something I can answer on this stream. So <laughs> there were a ton of super technical questions, and I was trying to get over a couple things without uh, going too deep in things that are going to make the police knock on my door. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we, we're we proud of our taxpayer-paid spacecraft, and uh, don't we want to be able to keep flying them and other countries that didn't contribute can catch up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Barry... How are you feeling? Like, we have Artemis 2 coming up. You're already working on parts for that. Is is the general feel of things that it's going well? Like, everything's popping along? Yeah. Or how are y'all yeah. feeling? Very excited. I know that at some point this year, I don't know the date, uh, the astronaut crew for Artemis 2 will be announced. Uh, don't know who, don't know when that will happen, but that's the next major thing I'm really excited for. Yeah. Uh, who will be flying on the spacecraft? Excellent. Uh, all I've heard... Uh, that it will be one Canadian will be on board Artemis 2. I would expect that there'll be a female astronaut, but I don't haven't heard that for certain. I expect that that will be the case. Okay. So I'm kind of thinking like I should create like a board of some kind with all the current <laughs> astronauts that are active and like pick your crew. With the little right. pin things, you know, like yeah. the little string going from here to there and like figure that out. It would be a fun game online. <laughs> Uh, geez, we should do like astronaut selection bingo. We do a stream bingo sometimes, and when somebody mentions, I'm like, "Oh, they mentioned shuttle bingo." Like um, NFL fantasy football nice. draft style. Astronaut <laughs> draft. Nice. Astronaut fantasy crew. draft. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. But y'all, that is going to bring us here to 5 p.m. Eastern time, um, the end of our show for today. Barry, I cannot say thank you enough for joining us. You were an absolutely fantastic, knowledgeable interesting guests we will have you on the show anytime your PO says you can come <laughs> i appreciate it i very much appreciate both you all for uh hosting this and man i sure would love to go up to the intrepid air and space museum someday that is a it's on my list of like the top three places i want to go nice. it, it really I is cool it. It is nice. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been great talking with you. Yeah, absolutely. Folks, make sure you toss a follow to Barry on uh, his Twitter. We've got those links in chat. It's just twitter.com slash Bonzac, B-O-N-Z-A-C-K. And all the different things that you get into, the first robotics announcing that you do, um, all the things that you're involved with. Barry, thank you so much for being a wonderful human being who is excited about what you do and help other people get excited too. And follow at LM Space as well. At LM Space. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll get the company in there too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Um, but also, folks, we had Summer Ash on the show today. Summer, thank you so much. Hey, I'm just happy to geek out with both of you. Abs it's, this was a, such a fun show. Like Sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, what are we going to talk about? And today it's just, let's talk about everything. There's so many different yeah. things to talk about. Um, but for now, y'all, that is going to be the end of this month's Astro Live show. Remember, the shows don't just happen. They're made possible through the NASA Cooperative Agreement. 
with awarded to the SpaceX the space the New York Space Grants Consortium. Wow, I usually don't mess that much that much that mess that much up so much. I can't talk because there's another stream happening here. Uh, if you're still watching the channel and you're interesting, what you're interested in what may be happening, the rest of the NSF team is set up to do that first launch of Rocket Lab out of Wallops today. So that stream. Think they're tracking some weather things. You know, the weather out there in Wallops in the winter is always a thing. But pay attention there. There may be a stream that starts right after this one. I haven't seen anybody tell me that that stream is not happening yet. Uh, also, next month, we have another special show here with Intrepid Museum. We're going to be talking about SWAT. We just saw that launch out of Vandy the other day. And that surfaced water observation... T um, mission that Alicia will tell me what the T stands for. We're going to be talking with experts from that mission here next month about the satellite that just successfully launched on that SpaceX Falcon 9. But for now, folks, thank you so much for watching. If you hang out for the wallop stuff, thank you for doing that. Make sure you follow the socials. We've already got Barry's social in there. You can follow at Intrepid Museum on Twitter, IntrepidMuseum.org to learn more information. If you're in New York City, a little side tripper over. Go see the shuttle there. See the uh, tiles on the shuttle. See the Soyuz they have there and the scoring on the side of it. And one day, who knows, maybe there'll be parts of uh, an Orion capsule that went around the moon after <laughs> Barry's team's done with it. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> one more time, Barry, Summer, thank you so much for being with us today. Merry Artemis, everybody. Merry Artemis. Merry Artemis. Quick, the virtual background. I love the Santa. Is that a sweater? <laughs> It is a sweater. It's, it's a my, sweater. Oh, there we go. It's my uh, <laughs> you can, sweater vest. You can also use it as a cloak of invisibility by holding it up, I Barry. Know, like, you sweater. totally disappear <laughs> when you hold it up. <laughs> Anyways, today's show was fantastic. For now, we will see you nerds later. Thanks for watching, y'all. I'm going to play the I'm, – I'm playing the intro music because it's fun to play the intro music. <laughs>